when you see the live stream, you can begin your recording. As a matter of fact, you can begin now. PC recording, you ready? PC recording done. Cloud recording. Okay, whoever's, Sergeant Katowski, you can begin with Cloud. the opening. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the committees on criminal justice, justice system, general welfare, public housing, and housing and buildings. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video. Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. That is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you. We're ready to begin. Council, can I begin? Yes, Chair Lansman. Good. Um, good afternoon. I'm Council Member Rory Lansman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and welcome to this joint hearing on the topic of housing and reentry with the Committee on Criminal Justice, chaired by Council Member Keith Powers, the Committee on General Welfare, chaired by Council Member Steve Levin, the Committee on Public Housing chaired by Council Member Alika Amprey samuel and the Committee on Housing and Buildings, chaired by Council Member Robert Cornegie. I want to start with some numbers. About 20,000 single adults enter the New York City shelter system each year. Approximately 30% of them come directly from institutional settings with the majority returning from state prisons and city jails. Between 2015 and 2018, 15,000 people came out of state prisons and went directly into the city's shelter system. During those same years, almost 2,000 people who were receiving mental health treatment while incarcerated in our city jails were released and entered into the shelter system immediately. The numbers, although brutal, brutal and unsustainably high, mask an even more cruel feature of our criminal justice system, by which we allow the markers of criminal justice system involvement to long outlive actual incarceration. Those continuing effects take the form of homelessness, failure to obtain government benefits, and vulnerability to a predatory ecosystem of shady actors, all operating to make successful reentry far more difficult than it was already bound to be. These challenges facing former incarcerated individuals can be overcome, but not without cohesive support and real preparation. Lawsuits and legislation have sought to address the challenges of successful discharge planning and continuity of care. And we'll hear today from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and the Department of Corrections on their efforts particularly around the development of more supportive housing, a critical concern for a portion of the population that routinely cycles between jails and shelters. Over the past seven months of the COVID-19 crisis, an unprecedented level of collaboration between the Department of Corrections, MOCJ, the NYPD, and the district attorneys allowed for the release from city jails of people deemed medically vulnerable or and not an unacceptable public safety risk. The city was forced by circumstances to respond quickly. And now we need to know what lasting lessons can be learned from the fact that so many individuals were safely moved into hotel sites, including a site in Fresh Meadows across the street from my district. We need to know the lessons learned from providing safe temporary housing linked with supportive services. We'll also hear from the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development and the New York City Housing Authority on the barriers individuals face in seeking or returning to public housing and federally subsidized housing. Finally today, we'll hear intro number 1760 sponsored by our colleague, Council Member Levine, which considers protections for tenants' privacy in the face of increasingly advanced security and access systems capable of monitoring and surveilling people without their knowledge or consent. 
I look forward to hearing from each of the agencies who will testify today, as well as legal services and other advocates and stakeholders. And with that, I turn it over to my colleagues and co-chairs for any additional opening remarks. Um, Council, will you call on um, the chairs individually or do you want me to do that? Uh, I can go ahead and call them, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so first we will hear from Council Member Levine. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Mark Levine, Chair of the Health Committee, but I want to thank Chairs Cornegie, Powers, Lanceman, Levin, and Amphrey Samuels, and I apologize for the barking in the background, working from home. Um, we'll be hearing today amongst this important topic, Intro 1760, the Tenant Data Privacy Act, which would create the nation's first protections for tenant data by regulating what information landlords can collect and how they can use it. If you live in an apartment in New York City, chances are that you don't use a traditional metal key to enter the front door. In recent years, there has been a rapid replacement of key locks in residential buildings right. with all manner of electronic entry right. systems, including personalized key fobs, sorry, smartphone apps, even biometric identifiers like fingerprints, eye scans, and facial recognition technology. Together, these technologies are often referred to as smart access or smart key systems. They have the potential to offer added convenience and safety for tenants. And they also have the potential to be abused by landlords because every time you swipe your fob or enter your ID code or pass your smartphone by the entry system, it generates a piece of data that logs your entry. The collection of this data risk compromising the privacy and safety of tenants and offers a potential tool for harassment by landlords. Intro 1760, which we are hearing today, is designed to prevent that abuse from occurring. It would prohibit the sale of collected data to third parties, prohibit the use of collected data for the purposes of eviction or any form of tenant harassment, limit the reference data collected by smart access systems to a tenant's name, apartment number, and contact information, prohibit smart access systems from being used by landlords for anything other than monitoring entrances, exits, and common areas, as well as for security purposes when service providers or third parties enter the building, and a number of other important safeguards, which I hope we'll talk about today. In short, this legislation would restrict data collected by landlords using such systems to the basic information they need to ensure the safety of the building and their tenants. The bill is not yet perfect. Uh, there are ways we hope we can make it even stronger. And I very much look forward to talking to members of the committee, tenant advocates and others about this bill and ways we might amend it. We wanna make sure that no New Yorker feels they're sacrificing their right to privacy and data security by living in a building that has a smart access system. I wanna thank the 26 fellow council members who have already co-sponsored this le legislation, which is also, I'm very happy to say, been endorsed by Tenants PAC. Again, thank you very much to the co-chairs for allowing me to speak and for your consideration of this important bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the interest of moving this hearing forward, the other chairs have agreed to waive their opening statements. So we will proceed with testimony from the administration. I'm Audrey Sun, counsel to the city council's committees on housing and buildings and public housing. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. When it is your turn, you will receive a prompt to unmute. Please accept the prompt. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically announce who will be testifying next. First, we will hear testimony from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, followed by a period of question and answer from the committee chairs and then committee members. We will then hear testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, Please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. 
Chairs will have 10 minutes each and committee members will be will have five minutes each, including responses. I will now administer the oath to all members of the administration. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. In order for us to properly record your response, I will pause in between each name. Are all of the members of the administration unmuted? Okay, I will begin to call names. Dana Kaplan, uh, excuse me. I will now administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dana yes. Kaplan. Sarah Mallory. I do. Yolanda Johnson-Peterkin. I do. Aaron Burns Main. I do. Brian Honan. Um, so Yolanda Johnson Peterkin and Aaron Burns Main will be testifying on behalf of NYCHA. Uh, thank you. Um, for purposes of the hearing, we do need to administer the oath to all members of the administration, uh, whether they are providing testimony or here just to respond to questions. Okay. They won't be responding to questions. Okay. Anna. Uh, Calabresi. Um, I, I, I do, I affirm. Nora Daniel. I do. Judy Beal. I do. Francis Torres. I do. Phil Turwheel. I do. Valerie Grysuk. I do. Brenda Cook. I do. Hazel Jennings. I do. Jamie Nichols. I do. Aaron Drinkwater. I do. Ben Farber. I do. And Jeanette Merrill. I do. Thank you. We will now proceed with testimony from Dana Kaplan from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, followed by Sarah Mallory from HPD. You may begin when ready. Good afternoon, Chair Lanceman and Chairs Powers, Cornegie, Levin, and Amprey Samuel, and the members of the committees on the justice system, criminal justice, housing, general welfare, and public housing. I'm Dana Kaplan, Deputy Director for Justice Initiatives and Close Rikers with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about MACJ's work on housing and reentry. MACJ advises the Mayor on criminal justice policy and is the Mayor's representative to the courts, district attorneys, defenders, and state criminal justice agencies, among others. MACJ designs, deploys, and evaluates citywide strategies to promote, to promote, to promote safety, reduce unnecessary arrests and incarceration, and improve fairness. MACJ works with law enforcement, city agencies, not-for-profits, foundations, the public, and others to implement effective strategies that improve public safety, prevent unnecessary incarceration, and build strong neighborhoods that ensure enduring safety. As our country and city continue to grapple with the twin challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, and systemic racism. It is imperative that we examine our services and programs to ensure that we are deploying our city's resources in the most effective and fair way possible. 
Fairness and equity are paramount to MockJ's mission and are integrated into the design and implementation of our services, programs, and analyses. In the last four years in New York City, we have seen an acceleration of the trends that have defined the public safety landscape in the city over the last three decades. New York City currently has the lowest incarceration rate of all large cities in the United States, with an average daily jail population of approximately 4,400 as of October 2020, a 59% decline from the start of the administration and a number that has not been seen in more than three decades. That average daily population has significantly decreased over the last seven months due to circumstances surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. These reductions were the product of the work of many focused on intentionally reducing the jail population while ensuring that crime also decreased. Our commitment to close Rikers Island is also dependent on continuing to reduce the jail population. The lightning touch of police and judges has meant that 43% fewer people left jails last year than at the start of this administration, and we anticipate that number to fall to approximately 14,000 by 2026. During this administration, we have seen some encouraging reductions in the return to jail, with reoffending falling to 36%. While this reduction is promising, the numbers of those who return are still too high. We are currently making major investments in services and a reshaping of the way that we deliver those services to ensure that they are effective. These investments and their effective deployment will be key in reducing the return rate further. Stable housing and wraparound services are critical components in reducing the number of or unsheltered homelessness. In addition, for those individuals who cycle into the jail system, supportive housing is one of the only evidence-based strategies that has been shown to reduce jail contact and decrease other systems use. A major component of MockJ's enhanced reentry strategy is expanding access to housing for experiencing, homeless, for experiencing homelessness who have, uh, sorry, <laughs> a major contact uh, component of MockJ's enhanced reentry strategy is expanding access to housing for those experiencing homelessness who have contact with the jail system. Current investments provide access to comprehensive community supports including transitional employment, supportive and transitional housing, and community-based mental health services for justice-involved New Yorkers. I'll elaborate here on some of our core programs that provide these services, including the Justice-Involved Supportive Housing Program. Justice-Involved Supportive Housing, or JISH, was originally funded by the Office of the District Attorney of New York as a recommendation of the Behavioral Health Task Force, convened by MockJ in December 2014. JISH targets individuals with significant behavioral health needs who continuously cycle through shelter and jail and places them in permanent supportive housing. As part of the plan to invest in communities and to close the jails on Rikers Island, MockJ funded transitional housing will expand to 500 beds, ensuring MockJ will be able to serve approximately 1,000 people per year who need housing to avoid detention or incarceration or acquire stable housing as they transition back to their communities after incarceration. This housing will also provide extensive supportive services modeled on the existing MockJ funded women's transitional housing program. MockJ currently funds 100 beds of transitional housing through the Fortune Society and its subcontractors, including Samaritan Taytop Village and Abraham House as well as 55 beds of transitional housing for women and 10 beds of transitional housing for women and their children through the Women's Community Justice Project, uh, six beds for women through the Fortune Society, six beds of, for women through the Fortune Society and the rest uh, through WCJP. MockJ is currently finalizing a new transitional housing RFP for approximately 250 beds in fiscal 22 and scaling up to 500 beds in fiscal 23. In addition to MockJ's current and planned transitional and supportive housing programs, COVID-19 has presented our city with an unprecedented challenge with a sun and, and with a sudden and impressing imperative to move people from city jails and other congregate settings into non-congregate settings to help limit the spread of the coronavirus. In order to maximize safety, 
Mock J worked with agency and nonprofit partners to stand up an entirely new set of services in under-enrolled hotels in New York City. Beginning in late March, Mock J worked with the New York City Office of Emergency Management and nonprofit partner Exodus Transitional Services to provide transitional housing to 40 clients who were serving city sentences but eligible for release to community supervision via Article 6A of State Corrections Law. These 40 clients were admitted to the LaGuardia Holiday Inn. From there, Mock J continued to, um, sorry, uh, from there, the hotel story is just so long and comprehensive. <laughs> Uh, from there, Mock J continued to coordinate an increased I don't, number I don't of releases. Think anyone of... would would criticize you if you uh, hit, just hit the highlights. Okay, uh, I, I will. I will try to speed. Uh, from there, Mock J continued to coordinate an increased number of releases of individuals from Rikers Island, many with underlying health conditions, which increased their risk of serious health complications from COVID nineteen and expanded the eligibility of the hotel program to be for all individuals recently released from state or local correctional facilities who do not have housing. By late July, Mock J had contracted with three hotels, Holiday Inn LaGuardia Ex Express and Wyndham Garden Fresh Meadows in Queens in Walcott, Manhattan. For each of these hotels, we are utilizing the entire site to provide emergency housing and services for those released from custody. Our nonprofit partner, Exodus, manages the program and provides services to released individuals. Clients are furnished with clothing, hygiene kits, face masks, and cell phones. Exodus arranges health services, including medication assistance and enrollment in Medicaid, medical, mental health, and substance abuse treatment. Exodus also assists clients with finding stable transitional or permanent housing and with family reunification. Clients also participate in employment training and placement. Housing Works, another reentry provider in the Jails to Jobs Transitional Employment Program, provides on site clinical services, including medical and behavioral health care. Other Jails to Jobs partners like Fortune, Osborne, CEO, 100 Suits, and FedCap have all worked together to provide critical elements of the services described above. To date, 507 individuals have been served by our nonprofit partners at the reentry hotels. In addition to services provided to release clients, the programs are also committed to being good neighbors. Exodus maintains open communication with community members and hosts community meetings in order to provide a forum for community feedback. The program is an example of the extraordinary coordination that we were able to affect during the height of the pandemic in order to promote the health and safety of those released from Rikers at this difficult time. We are proud of the pro program's success and we are grateful for the support of the council in helping to protect lives while also allowing those re released from Rikers Island time of significant approval. And finally, while the reentry of hotels are a feature of, of our COVID-19 response, MACJ continues to work toward ensuring that the kinds of services that truly help individuals released from custody achieve stability are more consistently available and offered to as many individuals as possible. Mock J and the Department of Correction are working together to improve and expand tightly coordinated in custody services and case planning in conjunction with transition and release planning. Upon release, interested individuals will work with a reentry mentor who will help facilitate all aspects of reentry on an individualized basis. The supports provided by this team of service providers will include assistance locating temporary or permanent stable housing as well as other wraparound resources determined by the specific needs of each returning individual. The reentry mentor will develop relationships with released individuals to encourage participation in relevant services and programs. We anticipate that the case planning and coordination combined with expanded service offerings and stronger relationships will help to ease the path to a stable life outside of custody and reduce the likelihood of return. We look forward to implementing these supports along with DOC and our nonprofit providers. We expect that the services will come online in January of 2021. Awards have recently been made to the following nonprofits. Center for Court Administration, uh, CCA, Center for Court Innovation, CCI, Friends of Island Academy, Osborne Association, Fortune Society, Urban Youth Alliance, FedCap, Women's Prison Association, Exodus Transitional Community, and Housing Works. These nonprofits will in turn subcontract with other smaller neighborhood-based and specialized service providers. 
Our current reentry services program, Jails to Jobs, has been operational since April of 2018. Since coming online, Jails to Jobs has been providing comprehensive community-based reentry support to individuals leaving DOC custody. As the name suggests, the hallmark of Jails to Jobs is offering paid transitional employment to all participants in the program. However, Jails to Jobs is about much more than employment alone. Jails to Jobs is built around offering individuals the comprehensive care that can help someone reenter successfully and reconnect with community and, sus and sustain employment. While COVID-19 has provided unprecedented challenges for Jails to Jobs providers and participants, with some services being provided remotely since March 2020, the Jails to Jobs community has risen to the challenge, adapted, and remained steadfast in its commitment to reentrance. We are proud to say that since its launch, Jails to Jobs has a achieve the following outcomes with over 4,500 program intakes, 1,450 transitional job placements, 1,180 permanent job placements, 770 job training sessions per month, and 1,700 supportive services each month, including substance abuse treatment, mental health and medical care, family supports, and housing assistance. In closing, uh, the mayor has demonstrated his commitment to reducing the justice system's impact on New Yorkers while maintaining the unprecedented improvements in our public safety. Maintaining and ultimately improving housing and supportive services available to individuals returning to their home communities from incarceration is a vital component of this work. And Makche will continue to work together with our city and nonprofit partners to move forward a future where that return home is as seamless and well supported as possible. We certainly understand that our, there are areas of the continuum and areas of the procurement process that can continue to be strengthened, and we are committed to working with our government and community partners toward that end. But at the same time, we are proud of the progress that has happened to date and the increased funding and prioritization that the city has focused on these critical services. Effective reentry benefits people coming home from incarceration and their families as well as the neighborhoods that they return to and all New Yorkers, as we can disrupt the needless cycle of return to jail. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present this testimony. Uh, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Um, are we gonna uh, have other government witnesses uh, testify first and then get to questions or are we gonna do mock J? and then um, have opening statements from other uh, agencies. Yes, there's testimony from just one other agency from HPD, so we'll hear from them now and then move to questions. Thank okay. you. Before we, before we go on to them, let me just acknowledge the presence of council members Lander, Cabrera, Chin, Cohen, Diaz, Jonai, Grudenchik, Holden, Lewis, Mazel, Perkins, Richards, Rose, Rosenthal, Gibson, and Rivera. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairs Carnegie, Powers, Landsman, Levin, and Ambry Samuel, and members of the committees here today. My name is Sarah Mallory, and I am the Executive Director of Government Affairs with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in Housing Reentry Services and Introduction 1760, sponsored by Council Member Levine. Just yesterday, Deputy Mayor for Housing and Economic Development, Vicki Bean, released the final Where We Live NYC plan, the city's blueprint for fair housing in the five boroughs. The plan is a culmination of a two-year planning process led by the Deputy Mayor's Office, HPD, and the New York City Housing Authority, and more than 30 city agencies. It presents a five-year plan to break down barriers to opportunity and build more integrated, equitable, and inclusive neighborhoods. Updated to reflect the disproportionate impact the COVID-19 pandemic has had on low-income communities of color, the plan also includes enhanced metrics, strategies, policy proposals, and new priorities to address a legacy of housing segregation and build a more inclusive city. In this effort, the city advocates for, advocates for increased policies designed to minimize the disproportionate impact that criminal records-based barriers pose, especially for people of color, while meeting the needs of New York City's diverse housing stock. And even before the administration's Where We Live NYC effort, HPD has always been tasked with creating safe, affordable housing, and under this administration, 
We are especially committed to providing such housing opportunities for the most vulnerable New Yorkers. This is why we have taken additional steps to make our affordable housing application process fairer for formerly incarcerated New Yorkers and reducing barriers to access affordable housing. For example, since 2015, HPD has dramatically reduced allowable credit history criteria for housing applicants in our city finance portfolio, prohibited home visits as criterion for resident selection, and ensured arrests that did not result in a conviction were not used against a housing applicant for any reason. We continue to evaluate our marketing guidelines and work with our partners in this area, as my colleague at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice noted, by most recently partnering with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, who released the Justice Involved Supportive Housing RFP in December 2019 as a commitment to expand access to housing, including supportive housing, for people with a history of involvement in the criminal justice system. Supportive housing is one of HPD's best tools to meaningfully address the needs of people living on the street or in shelter with serious mental illness and or substance use disorder, who may have also had a history of criminal justice involvement by creating low barrier entry to high quality, affordable, permanent housing. HPD also requires units in certain city financed affordable housing projects to be set aside for formerly homeless individuals. With the council's support, HPD has been providing homeless housing at a faster rate than ever before by building or preserving nearly 13,000 homes since 2014. We are grateful to the council and speaker Corey Johnson for their leadership on this issue. In regards to intro 1760, the de Blasio administration has made protecting tenants a core part of its strategy to confront the affordable housing crisis and has worked in partnership with the city council and various branches of government to tackle the issue with a comprehensive multi-pronged approach. As a city, we are focused on keeping people in their homes and neighborhoods by creating and preserving historic numbers of affordable homes, empowering tenants with more resources, aggressively enforcing city codes, successfully advocating with many members of the council to close loopholes and rent regulation laws at the state level, and utilizing all of our partnerships to create data-driven, innovative tools targeted at stopping harassment before it starts. Physical security is an important part of ensuring that residents feel safe in their homes. Currently, HPD can and does issue violations for building entrance doors and individual unit doors without lock sets in rental buildings or those with only electronic entry mechanisms. Intro 1760 would require owners of multiple dwellings that utilize keyless entry systems to provide tenants with a data retention and privacy policy, establish restrictions on the collection and use of data from such systems and from tenants' usage of utilities and internet services, including requiring consent from tenants to use such information, restricting the sharing of such information with third parties, and requiring that any data collected be destroyed within a given time. While the administration supports the goal of protecting tenant data and this bill's requirement that owners provide tenants with a data retention and privacy policy, we encourage further conversation with other relevant partners in government to understand the best privacy practices and operational necessities this bill would require. HPD does not currently, nor would it alone, have expertise in privacy, data retention, and enforcement practices for violations. This type of initiative would need further assessment with the city's chief privacy officer and other relevant city officials to identify the appropriate enforcement mechanisms and relevant expertise. Thank you again for the invitation to testify and for this hearing on this bill today. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. We will now open for questions from the chairs, beginning with Chair Lanceman, followed by Chair Cornegy, Amprey Samuel, Powers, and then Levin. Chair Lanceman. Thank you. And just so everybody's clear, we're going to give the chairs 10 minutes uh, for questions and then the members five minutes. And then if anyone wants a second round, um, we'll try to accommodate that uh, as well. Um, so let's uh, start with <clears throat> Mach J from me. I just want to clarify something, um, and I don't mean to be overly uh, parochial, but uh, in your testimony, you had said that in July, Mock J had contracted with three hotels, including the one just outside of my district in council member Grudenchik's district, the Wyndham Garden Fresh Meadows in Queens. But um, actually, didn't those hotels start operating in April? And it was only in July when we learned of them. Uh, yes, so thank you, uh, Chair Lansman, for that question. Uh, yes, so 
there was the, we began uh, some of the hotels in April and then there was a new contract put in place in July uh, and the contracts were transferred over. So certainly uh, I hope that the testimony reflected that people were moved in hotels uh, or some individuals at least uh, in, in April at the height of the pandemic. <clears throat> Got it. I appreciate that. Um, let me just ask the sergeant at arms. I don't see my clock counting down, and that's going to create problems for me and, and the other member. There we go. Thank you. Um, Apologies, I'll, sir. I'll, otherwise, I'll just go on forever. Um, I, I only bring that up, uh, Ms. Kaplan, because, uh, you know, what, uh, speaking for myself, I'm supportive of that effort. Um, myself and other uh, colleagues, Mr. Grudentrick will speak for himself, of course, have, um, as we say in the business, spent considerable political capital in defending the decision to move residents into the Wyndham, where, as predicted, it's been fine, and it's been good for the residents, and it's been fine for the community. Um, but that uh, is undermined when uh, things happen without our awareness. So I know that Mock J is in, in the course of this uh, promised us that that would never happen again. Um, but please, uh, I just would like you to reiterate uh, that commitment that you will not spring on uh, elected officials or, or communities, um, facilities that are gonna cause a lot of public inquiry uh, without, without letting us know first. Yes, and absolutely. At the height of the COVID pandemic, you know, some of these hotels were stood up literally within days and moments as we uh, tried to respond uh, to what was this public health crisis mm -hmm. and identify the sites that we could bring online, identify the service providers, uh, execute emergency contracts and, you know, transport people at sometimes in, you know, in, in late hours uh, to get them into hotels and shelter as quickly as possible. You and others have certainly made clear, uh, appropriately so, on behalf of your communities, the need for uh, continued communication and transparency with neighborhoods uh, about these hotel locations. And you know, we have heard that loud and clear. And obviously, as as you know, there have been a number of community meetings, uh, site visits. Um, you know, we have been working very very hard to make sure that now information is available. And I think Exodus Transitional Services has also been a very strong partner as, you know, I mentioned uh, uh, organizing community cleanups and volunteer yeah, for, opportunities for my, and we my, really are striving to be a neighborhood right. partner. From, from my perspective and, and others may, you know, express their own views, I've been very happy with Exodus and their cooperation with, with the community. So let's move on from that. And let's talk about the um, supportive housing uh, uh, program. The, the points of agreement, which was more or less the, the, the agreement between the council and the mayor in order to move forward with the closing Rikers agenda, which I fully support, um, would fund an additional, as I understand it, additional 380 units of uh, supportive housing, bringing the total to 500, which is an $11 million uh, investment by 2026. Um, can you give us an update on the effectiveness of the um, program in addressing those people who most frequently cycle through shelter and criminal justice systems? Yeah, so I'll start just in terms of affirming the funding, and then I will invite Anna Calabrese, who is the executive director of reentry, to speak more about the effectiveness of the programs and the impact. Um, as you noted, just there's a current uh, investment of $8 million uh, in transitional housing. Uh, we are ramping up to $12.5 million in fiscal 22, and there is an RFP that will be forthcoming shortly uh, towards that end. We've been um, hosting uh, sessions with service providers to ensure that the RFP is as effective as possible in, in, in the impact on reducing recidivism and providing effective services. Uh, and as you noted, uh, in the points of agreement document, there is a commitment to uh, increase ultimately to a uh, 25 million level. And so, you know, this is something that uh, we welcome as an administration. And, you know, I, I think that that expansion is certainly needed. Just, Anna, can just you- to, Just to clarify, I'm sorry. It, to, to get to 25 million or it's 25 million on top of the 5 million 
that had been baseline for tra transitional housing. So to get to 25 or to get to 30? I think that that 25 includes the 5 million that was baselined in year one. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, Anna, can you speak to the impact of the programming? Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you for that question, council member. Um, you know, MockJ and our provider community really remain committed to providing quality transitional housing to as many eligible individuals in New York City as possible. Um, while it's difficult to attribute um, sort of effects of recidivism to any one particular program, um, what we can say in terms of the effectiveness is a report on WCJP, the Women's Community Justice Project, found that 98% of participants uh, in the program had maintained their freedom. Um, and, you know, it's so it's, you know, 90, 98% of participants in the program did not uh, return to custody um, within the, the period of analysis. Um, so, but again, you know, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint um, the effects um, on recidivism to any one program. And, you know, we can't definitively say um, that transitional housing reduces recidivism or re-arrest rates. But as we continue to expand transitional housing and expand these programs, um, we anticipate including more robust analysis into the design um, to continue to track rates of re-arrest um, as closely as possible. Thank you. Um, the points of agreement also included up to $1.4 million allocated in FY21 to double the size of the NYCHA family reunification program through the uh, MACJ reentry RFP. Can you give us an update on the status of, of this commitment? Yes, so the as outlined in the points of agreement, there was a commitment to double the services uh, that were available to 200 slots for participants. And that will be part of the programming and services that I referenced earlier that will come online in January, 2021. Uh, so we are on track for that commitment. Okay. All right, let's get off of um, uh, housing specifically. Um, in your testimony, you indicated that awards have been made to 10 nonprofits for expanded reentry services with the services expected to begin in, in this January. How long are the, is the contract term? How many people are expected to be served? What kind of monitoring will MockJ be doing? Um, as much information as you can give us would be, would be helpful. Great, I'm gonna invite Anna to speak to this again. Thank you, Council Member. Um, so we're really excited about the launch of the reentry RFP. Uh, it's been delayed because of COVID. Um, we finally were able to make some awards and we really are committed to launching uh, in January of 2020. Um, and one of the unique uh, the uniquenesses of this RFP and something that's made possible by the real reductions in the jail population are that we are able to uh, offer these services to everyone coming out of city jails. Um, that is a real sort of expansion of the population um, as delineated in past um, reentry programs. So the idea is that everyone walking out of the city jail system um, can connect to services in the community, as well as start that journey and connection with providers while they are in custody. Um, that kind of coordination with DOC um, is really baked into the fabric of the RFP. And in my, my remaining moments, um... I have to bring up the story that was reported in the city on the difficulty that um, uh, those released from Rikers have in getting identification, whether it's the NYC ID or just getting their driver's license back after they have turned them in. Um, so what can you tell us about that particular problem? Thank, thank you, Council Member. Um, this is an issue that is, is really close to our heart in terms of improving reentry services for New Yorkers. I think there's broad consensus uh, that we can do more, that we should do more, that we will do more to help individuals leaving city jails obtain ID. We're currently in the process of uh, beginning a sort of multi-agency task force to address this very issue um, with the Department of Correction, with Correctional Health Services, with our colleagues in the state, colleagues at NYPD, to really try to finally untangle the Gordian knot um, of this problem. 
Um, you know, I've watched many great minds and, and policy leaders work on this issue for many years and, and no one has been able to really wrap their arms around it. And we feel that with the launch of the reentry RFP and those additional services and our partnership with DOC and CHF, which has really been sort of reaffirmed through the COVID crisis, as well as with our colleagues in the state, we can finally sort of chip away at this issue um, and, and get to a place where more reentrants are able to start the ID process, obtain ID before they are released. So it's a commitment that we are making. Great. And I'm, uh, I assume we can uh, rely on Mach J providing us with the budget and I'm contract. Thank you. The budget and contract information for all of these uh, RFPs and, and, and the, the awardees. Yes, happy to share that information. Got it. All right. Well, my time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now take questions from Chair Cornegie, followed by Chair Ampri Samuel. So I'm having some technology Starting issues. Starting time. With my sorry, before you begin, Chair Cornegie, sorry, I just want to mention that we've been joined by the Majority Leader, Lori Cumbo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lansman. I'm asking if uh, we can come back uh, to me and go on to Alika. I'm having some technical difficulties with my questions. Sure, can we move to Chair Ampri Samuel, please? Starting time. Good afternoon, everyone. My questions are you know, clearly about public housing, clearly about NYCHA, and so we'll just jump right into it. Um, in reference to the permitted exclusion rules in the New York City Housing Authority. Can someone begin to explain what is permanent exclusion and in what context is permanent exclusion pursued? Sure. Good afternoon, Chair. Um, my name is Erin burns -Main. I'm with the Office of Intergovernmental Relations. Um, so thank you for the question. Permanent exclusion is a policy um, used by NYCHA to promote the safety and security of our residents while also preserving the household's tenancy. Um, we, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, permanent exclusion happens when we bring a termination of tenancy action against a NYCHA tenant for dangerous conduct that violates the tenant's lease agreement. Um, a member of the household or someone else under the tenant's control may have committed the dangerous conduct Instead of terminating the lease, which would mean evicting the entire family, um, permanent exclusion allows NYCHA to preserve the family, the household's tenancy by excluding only the dangerous person or persons that were involved. An excluded person is barred from residing in or visiting the apartment as long as the permanent exclusion is in place. Um, and just as a bit of context, Housing authorities across the country um, that don't have a policy like permanent exclusion may seek to terminate the entire household in those cases. Um, to the second part of your question, uh, we bring these cases of non-desirability, um, which includes, but isn't limited to major crimes such as murder, sex offense convictions, robbery, assault, drug dealing, and guns. Um, other than the two federal bans relating to lifetime registered sex offenses and the production of producing methamphetamines on public housing grounds, um, NYCHA is not governed by rigid rules uh, that require us to pursue eviction or exclusion based on a specific type or level of criminal charge or any specific conduct. Rather, we examine each case individually, including the nature and seriousness of the conduct, the extent of the individual's involvement, the danger that the individual poses to the NYCHA community, um, whether there's any serious prior convictions or any mitigating evidence that's been presented. Um, so um, can you just give us um, a list of the types of criminal offenses that NYCHA would actually pursue um, for permanent exclusion? And can you give us a breakdown of those offenses um, for 2016, 2017, and 2018, 2019, and year to date. So sure. since 2016. Yes, thank you for the question. So um, we actually have data, annual statistics available for 2017 on, um, and that data was pulled, and I believe actually was a result of a um, city council hearing back in uh, 2017, yes. Um, 
that required us to put these annual reports together. Um, so those reports are placed on our website. We also have a detailed breakdown that we're happy to provide. Um, I can provide a summary verbally um, and then happy to go into detail on any In the interest of my time, because clearly I'm gonna have to go to round two questions, Chair. So, um, um, so can you just give me like a quick breakdown of summary? Yes. Of the absolutely. types of offenses. That's right, okay. So um, for 2017, we'll go into number and then type. So for 2017, there was 1,502 uh, total closed cases. 2018, 1,338. 2019, 1,363. And 2020, as of March 16th, and I'll explain that in a second, it was 205. And the reason for that is because we um, put a pause on all of our um, administrative actions at the start of the COVID-19 crisis. So that was dated March 16th of 2020. So our year-to-date numbers are very low this year. The types of um, offenses that are in that category, um, attempted murder, arson, fire, assault, burglary, conspiracy, possession, sale of controlled substance, firearms and weapons charges, grand larceny, harassment, kidnapping, murder, rape, reckless endangerment, registered sex offenders, robbery, search warrants, and sexual abuse charges. And um, I have those all broken out by charge that we'd be happy to provide you. Can you let me know how many of those actually led to a family being excluded? Um, so those, the ones that I've listed are all for individuals who were excluded. So the, the 1502, the 1338, the 1363, the 205, those were all, and those are separate numbers, not the same families. Those are individual numbers per year. Those are the total number of non-desirability cases for each year. So those are, they are all based in the year that the case was opened, but you're right that there shouldn't be duplicating them. So if I was to total all of those, like the 1,500, the 13, the 13, the 205, if I was to total that, so between 2016 and year to date, there's some, I don't know, uh, 3,500 cases or so of permanently excluded families or individuals. That, that would okay. be correct. It would be the number of exclusions. Okay, and what's the average age? of the individuals. And can you tell me the youngest person and the oldest person? Um, so we actually do not have the, um, the youngest and oldest, we do have average age for you. Um, and it's just over 34 years old. It's 34.1 years old. Um, and we can get you the, uh, the youngest and the oldest. And I apologize, just to clarify, um, the number of exclusions coming from terminations, um, we're, we're clarifying. So in 2017, it was 464. 2018, it was 313 resulting in a PE. So these are the cases that were brought and then resulting in a PE was a smaller number. Again, we're happy to provide you a written breakout of all of these different cases. Okay, so can you, so going back to 2017, the total number of cases that were brought and then the, the number that was actually excluded, can you say that again? Just give me 2017 as an example. 1,502. Okay. And um, 464 resulted in a PE. Oh, okay. So the number that I threw out a few minutes ago was not correct. It's That's still right. lower. Okay. It was the total number of cases that were brought. Okay, all right. How many termination of Tennessee cases did NYCHA pursue? Um, wait a minute. Uh, oh, okay. Um, for each of those years, how many resulted in the permanent, permanent exclusion and not a termination of the actual tenancy? So cases, okay, so cases that result in a permanent exclusion, that is a type of stipulation. So by, um, by a case resulting in a permanent exclusion, it would, it would not uh, result in the termination of the family. So the household, in cases of permanent exclusion, the household would remain housed and it would not result in a termination of tenancy. So out of the numbers that you just gave me with the permanent exclusions, did any of those lead to a termination of the actual tenancy for that family in that unit in that apartment. They should. They should not be. Um, so they're. 
um, there should not have been a case where that had happened um, okay. based on the fact that it's a stipulation. Okay, so now can you um, give me the number of how many termination of Tennessee cases did NYCHA pursue in those same years, including year to date? And of those, how many cases are due to criminal offenses? Um, so we have, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking through your question, bear with me. Um, so the first question I asked you was related to the permanent exclusion for the individual that had a criminal case against them. And so now I'm asking how many of the families were actually um, evicted from NYCHA because of a criminal offense? Um, we, let's see, we have, we have the numbers on non-desirability cases. Um, I believe what you're asking is about of the permanent exclusion um, cases, how many of those had a violation of that stipulation that then resulted in the family being evicted? Is that correct? I mean, it could be. I mean, but so do you do so do you do separate cases based on desirability? So if that's the case, do you keep separate numbers for the termination of tenancy? So if that's the case, and you can you can answer that question as well. Sure. So um, we'll take a step back. So when um, when there is a permanent exclusion case, it is a stipulation. So by signing this permanent exclusion, the household will stay housed so long as they agree to and follow the stipulation and that that person stays out of the household. So by definition, by entering the permanent exclusion, they're avoiding a termination of tenancy. Um, but to the heart of your question, it sounds like what you're looking for is uh, how many of those of that portion of folks then um, then violated the permanent exclusion and did that result in a termination, we can find that information out for you. I don't have those numbers handy. Okay, I would like to know the answer to that question. And I would also like to know, is there a way you can be evicted from NYCHA and it not start from a permanent exclusion? It could be something where maybe the person wasn't permanently excluded. You know, There was a family household that had a criminal case against them and NYCHA decided to pursue the eviction, you know, based on the information that they received from NYPD that wasn't related to a stipulation. So mm -hmm. is that a process? Yes, so a household can be terminated based on um, criminal activity. The stipulation is just one option for the hearing office and for the family um, of stipulation of permanent exclusion. If they don't agree to that stipulation or if it's not offered based on what the activity is, a household could be terminated based on justice involvement. Okay, so I just wanted to be clear that I asked that same exact question and I'll go back. I said, how many termination of Tennessee cases did NYCHA pursue in 2016, 17, 18, 19, the year to date? And of those, how many cases are due to criminal offense? So the question is, how many termination of Tennessee cases did NYCHA pursue due to criminal offense? So that was, that was the question that I asked. Okay, apologies for any confusion. I thought we were specific to permanent exclusion. Um, I clearly we said it was two different questions. No, my apologies. Oh, okay. uh, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying now. Um, so what we'll do is provide you a breakdown of those two different categories. When? Um, we maybe, I would like to get them to you during this hearing and I will work on getting those. Okay, so I'll just stop there um, and I will clearly um, need a second round. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, before we move on to the next Chair's questions, I uh, just want to recognize that we've been joined by council member uh, Van Bramer from Queens. Thank you. We will now return to Chair Cornegie for questions. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. Again, thank you for your patience. Um, uh, my questions are uh, fiscal. As part of the points of agreement, the mayor and the council agreed to 380 additional JIS units for a total of 500 beds. And I think you mentioned this in your testimony and a total investment of 11.2 million by 2026. For people who are homeless with a history of justice involvement, please provide an update on the progress of this commitment. Sure, uh, thank you very much. And uh, for an update on the JISH beds, I'm actually gonna invite the DOHMH representative to provide that update. Good afternoon. 
DOHMH released uh, an RFP for the additional 380 beds of justice-involved supportive housing in December of 2019. It's an open-ended RFP. It's, it's on the street right now. Unfortunately, we haven't received any satisfactory uh, responses at this date. We are actively uh, working with the provider community and collaborating with agencies, um, with the Corporation for Supportive Housing, rather, to uh, promote more interest and responses in this RFP. Uh, so in addition to, to that question or to, to expound on it, the mayor agreed as part of the points of agreement to add 25 million on top of the 5 billion baseline in the city's budget for transitional housing. And I'm saying that with the backdrop of understanding the $9 billion deficit that we find ourselves in. Um, uh, the city's budget for transitional housing service to enable people to avoid jail by participating in ATVs and ATIs. What's the status of this item? And, and the, the original agreement was uh, a total investment by fiscal year 20, uh, by fiscal year 23, I'm sorry. Yes, so uh, you're correct that it was a commitment of a, for transitional uh, housing, 25 million by fiscal 23. Uh, with a, uh, and that by fiscal 22, we would have a $12.5 million investment. And so there is an RFP that will be forthcoming very shortly uh, from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice that will be uh, to begin that process of uh, expanding the transitional housing beds and, and the, that initial uh, commitment of up to 12.5. And obviously, you know, the points of agreement document and overall still stands. So um, this wasn't included in my prepared questions, but I do have to ask, while we're doing this pivot and shift and while we're um, uh, moving towards spending this amount of money on reentry, I'm sorry, reentry beds, um, is there a commitment from the agency uh, for an MWBE component, uh, um, a, uh, a percentage of MWBE components? And I'm only saying that because I've, I've realized and said before that while we are attempting to uh, stabilize uh, very quickly, it's still, I don't want to miss an opportunity to begin to include MWBEs in the mayor's aggressive, you know, 30% MWBE uh, participation. Like we're going to have serious opportunities by which to do that, even in this realm. Um, and I don't want to miss an opportunity. So is there a commitment um, to make sure that part of this reinvestment on um, people returning to the community and the beds are invested in MWB companies? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, that's a, a, an important point and an important opportunity uh, in this effort. I will say just generally speaking about, for instance, the reentry services uh, RFP that we have issued, we have really been uh, focused on wanting to ensure that in addition to the you know number of providers that I mentioned in my testimony that there are subcontracts with smaller uh, neighborhood-based organizations, and that that's certainly an opportunity to ensure uh, some, you know, progress in terms of MWBE uh, organizations. I will say that on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, there uh, is someone, and I think that this is a, a commitment throughout the administration as a whole. Um, there is someone now on our senior leadership team that is just focused on uh, the question of uh, our MWBE um, goals. And so uh, she will be working with the justice initiatives and reentry team um, towards that end. And I think that you're absolutely right that this is an, an opportunity um, to ensure that we are uh, making that commitment in these contracts. So I, I would also just, uh, and I'll, I'll go back to my original questions on the next round, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that it kind of bristled the hair on the back of my neck when I hear the subs. Uh, my my uh, primes are screaming at me at all times to make sure that they're included and have an opportunity, right? These these, these contracts um, are not, you know, tremendously lucrative, but they are the pathway to some of the subs becoming primes. I mean, I don't want to miss that opportunity. I would be remiss if I didn't bring that up. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to uh, uh, browbeat you on this, but the MWBE participation is incredibly important, but also moving prime, moving subs to primes, even in this realm. And I know that this is not what we intended to discuss, but this is an excellent opportunity as we pivot and shift and talk about recovery and resiliency and all of those things to be inclusive of MWBEs, not only as subs, but also try to put them on a pathway to being primes on these major contracts. 
uh, chair, it is not considered a browbeat at all. Uh, that is actually, I think, um, in a very important point. And some of the prime vendors in this RFP were uh, organizations that historically have been uh, subs in other RFP processes. And so, you know, I think the intention of subcontracting can, you know, very much be an opportunity uh, to be able to work with the organizations and develop some of the infrastructure to become um, the, the prime vendor itself. But I think ab absolutely that we should look at it as such, and we certain, certainly should not be limiting um, you know, organizations uh, as to, to not becoming primes themselves. And that's something that's already been happening. Well, thank you for your answer. And thank you for uh, not thinking that this is browbeating. It's just important to, to myself uh, the BLAC and the council at large has, has, has really made a commitment, and so is the administration. So I just want to point out when there's opportunities for both of us to meet the goals that we've set aside for or set up for, for success for our MWBs. And the last question before I'm, uh, I, I get on for the next round is, the points of agreement included up to 1.4 million allocated in fiscal 2021 to double the size of NYCHA family reunification programs through Mock J reentry RFP. Please update the committee on the status of this committee. Yes, so uh, those, so we are on track uh, to provide those 200 services, which is a, a doubling of what the services are that had been available, um, you know, in support of the reunification pilot, um, which, you know, has had significant demonstrated success. And so those will also be coming online in January 2021. And, and, and lastly, uh, you mentioned uh, she would be helpful and from the mayor's office. I don't know who that person is. If we could just circle back and make the committee aware of who's responsible for the MWBE commitment. I'd love to work with them as the chair of the MWBE task force at the council. I'd love to be able to work with them, with her. Well, great. So that and, and uh, that was Tina Chu on behalf of the mayor's office of criminal justice. I know that different agencies all have uh, appointed different individuals to play this role. Thank you, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Lansman. I'll, I'll uh, relinquish the rest of my time for the next round. Thank you. Thank you. We will now take questions from Chair Powers. Thank you. Council Member Carnegie, not using all his time. We like to see efficiency in the council. I probably will, though. So uh, uh, nice to see everybody. Thank you guys for doing this hearing and all the agencies. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly, uh, but I want to just go back to IDNYC and ID. This is a DOC or Mach J question, which is you we're not that specific. So can you talk to us about your more specific challenges when it comes to providing IDs to folks with, when it comes to reentry. I know we've had this discussion in the past, but can you outline can you outline for us some of the actual specific challenges that the agencies have when it comes to providing identification? Sure, Anna, can you yeah. speak yes. to that? Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, so there are, you know, there are several challenges that I think are, are quite well documented. Um, number one, I think, would be the fact that length of stay is is somewhat unknowable for individuals in city jail custody compared to individuals who are in the state. Um, so often there, there may not be the sufficient runway of time that one needs to um, prepare the background documentation for ID and to um, help someone to have an actual ID in their hand. Um, so that's, that's definitely historically a challenge. Um, then there is the issue that, you know, many folks who are in custody um, may lack um, an ID, of course, but also like the supportive collateral documentation that's needed to obtain further points of identification. So um, it's really that whole sort of ground up building um, the portfolio that's needed to apply for identification process. Um, and some of that requires technology and in-person visits. And, you know, there's, there's some policy work needed to, um, again, sort of untangle all of the, uh, the knots that, that go into making, even getting that collateral documentation um, so difficult. You know, and then there are, um, there are issues around, you know, when folks are discharged, ensuring that they have uh, identification um, as close to the time of discharge as possible. So getting what they had, you know, folks actually taking what they have um, with them home is, is another challenge. Um, so, so those are some of the, the main, I mean. 
Okay, I, you know, uh, Councilman Lanson mentioned that we we do want to see if we can be helpful in that process and to try to untangle those, and also want to add some urgency to that process. But I I recognize they recognize some of those challenges, but we're ready to help in any regard to make identification because I think it is a real issue. Um, just in sake of time, we'll I'll follow up with you guys on that particular issue with the DOC and Mock J. Um, this is for HPD, and I wanted to ask. Um, uh, um, are owners or developers of units of affordable housing, lot of like lotteries, are they able to reject potential tenants on the basis of criminal history? Yeah, thank you for that Sorry. question, Councilor. Uh, we do have restrictions in our marketing guidelines, so we severely limit the kind of things that they can look at. You know, it is HPD's goal to help the most vulnerable whenever possible. And so we started making a lot of aggressive changes in 2015. So for example, um, you know, they cannot have considerations for arrests with no convictions. Um, you know, the look back period has been severely shortened. And if there were offenses, only if it's a crime against a person or property. So there are a lot of restrictions around what's allowed to be looked at. And those are in your, not your regulatory agreements, those are in your market, your, those are in your marketing guidelines? Yes. So anything that is going through our affordable housing lottery is subject to those marketing guidelines and requirements. Okay. Has HPD made, had any consideration recently about revising those or updating those? I mean, both in light of the conversation that NYCH is having right now with their proposed rules and obviously legislation we're having here. Um, has HPD had any uh, thoughts or any uh, suggestions in terms of changing that? Yeah, great question. Uh, in general, we do update our guidelines frequently and in response to our work with our partners, the council members and, um, you know, the advocates and folks in the community and of course the tenants that we serve. Um, and so we definitely are having ongoing conversations around this piece and appreciate your thoughts on that. Okay, thank you. I think I see Aaron Drinkwater here and HRA and DSS and company, uh, but I also, yeah, from, I see Aaron turning her camera on. Uh, um, uh, it, I, mean, this, I think this is for you, but how many people returning from jails or state prisons last year were able to avoid going to shelter with a city FEPS voucher? Do you have data on that? Or perhaps it's for Mach J. Um, I, no, I, it's, it's for us. Um, so yes. Um, let me just pull up, sorry. So um, we have the data for uh, since program inception um, and that was uh, 77 individuals um, out of the a little over 200 or two, sorry, excuse me, 2000 single adults who utilized um, the city for HEPs uh, voucher generally. Um, okay, and seven, so what is the 77 number? So that is um, the that is from when the program began in October 2018 through September 2020. 77 individuals, uh, single adults with a DOC discharge prior to shelter. Shelter. So that's that's a that's city DOC. Correct. Okay, and do you, do you have state data for uh, coming out of a state correctional system? I I don't have the state data. Okay. I'll follow up with you on, on that as well. And um, do we have a data on how many clients entered the shelter system from state and city correctional facilities last year? I do, yeah. Um, so um, this is a point in time. Um, so as of August 20, uh, August 2020, 4.5% uh, of the single adult census in DHS had been in uh, DOC custody in the last year, and then using that same point in time measurement of August 2020, 9.3% um, of the DHS single adult census uh, was on parole from New York State uh, Department of Corrections. Okay, that's 4.5 and 9.3 of those numbers, record, okay. And just from a DSS standpoint, can you tell us what you see as the main hurdles for this, this population in terms of finding housing, since you, know, you guys have such a, a viewpoint here in the city? what do you see as the largest challenges? Sure, I appreciate the question. Um, I think one of the things that we have been focused on um, at the state level um, is a bill that's sponsored by Senator Sepulveda and Assemblymember Weprin um, that would uh, really focus on, it would amend the corrections law and really focus on discharge planning um, at the state level um, to ensure that inmates are able to obtain housing prior to 
uh, released to community supervision. Um, we know that there are significant numbers of individuals who are leaving state correctional facilities. Um, and what happens is they are discharged directly to shelter. Um, there are some instances in which our teams are able to provide uh, some you know, resources uh, to determine um, opportunities to divert entry into shelter. Um, but we really believe that the obligation should be squarely on the state uh, corrections teams um, to appropriate discharge planning um, and to be able to work with our teams um, to lay out what those alternatives are um, compared to, or as opposed to uh, entry into shelter. Um, the other, I think, important piece um, of the bill is that it really does um, put uh, some of the fiscal burden back to the state uh, where it should be appropriate placed in terms of what the responsibility is uh, for the state corrections. Okay, I'll take a look at this evolve. I think I've seen it, but I'll take a look at that one. So thank you, Aaron. Um, uh, just a couple more questions here. Um, I want to go to NYCHA for a second, just talk about your proposed rulemaking out there right now related to criminal history. And then I want to do one more to DOC. I'll just ask them both now, and then maybe uh, we can take each agency to answer them. The first one for NYCHA, you have proposed amendments out there right now related to criminal um, history, criminal justice in terms of housing that allows for an individualized re review. I believe that's out there in the rulemaking process right now. I think maybe open for public comment. I don't know if it's closed yet or not. Can you um, tell us about the, the proposed uh, changes, where that is, what feedback you've heard from tenants so far, and what kind of criteria would the committees that are doing the individualistic review consider in its holistic screening of persons, persons that are, uh, have been criminal just, justice involved? And what would NYCHA consider evidence of rehabilitation? That's question A1, A, B, C, and D. And then, um, and then the second one is just to refresh this with DOC, I wanted to get an update on birth certificates. Um, uh, I believe that the council with the 6A program, um, uh, there was like, like we, they can get assistance with getting a, obtaining their birth certificate and wanted to get information updates and data in terms of how many individuals were able to do that um, prior to release and post release. Um, so I'm sorry to throw all that at you guys. I'll start with NYCHA and then we can go to DOC on the second question. Thank you so much, council member. Um, so thank you for uh, bringing up our uh, current open public comment on all of our policies related to criminal justice involvement. Time um, expired. Um, so earlier this year, uh, NYCHA embarked on um, an assessment of all of our policies that impact folks with criminal justice histories or criminal justice involvement, whether that is someone who is a new applicant to NYCHA or seeking to return home to their family in NYCHA housing. Um, outside of those two federal bans that I mentioned earlier, the lifetime registered uh, sex offense conviction or um, being convicted of producing methamphetamines in public housing, um, NYCHA essentially has listed um, every everything that we have within our discretion and has put that out for public comment. We released it on September 14th. Um, it was originally put out for 30 day public comment. We've extended it um, 14 days. So the comments are due by October 28th. Um, so there is still a full another week of comments coming in. Um, and this is really an effort to modernize our policies. Um, this is not something that we are required to do. It's actually something we have not done in any of our recent history, um, put something out for public comment comment and feedback like this, but we really are seeking um, some of the thoughtful comments um, from different stakeholders, residents, tenant leaders, um, some of those resident bodies, as well as the advocacy community um, and other community members um, who have thoughts on this. Um, and so we are uh, just kind of in a summary of what has been put out for public comment. Some of the recommendations that NYCHA has put forward are utilizing a committee review for any application that may have been denied based on an item on a criminal background check. Um, using this individualized review process to better assess justice involvement within our current look back periods, 
changing the definition of current drug use um, from use within the last three years to use within the last year, um, setting a minimum age for permanent exclusion, and changes to automatically lift the permanent exclusion after five crime-free years um, should the tenant of record agree that it would be good for that person to return home. Um, we have made recommendations in these areas only as a jumping off point in uh, the conversation, um, but we really are looking forward to hearing from folks on these different areas. Um, I'm gonna turn it to my colleague, uh, Yolanda Johnson-Peterkin to answer the second half of your question, which is around the documentation that is uh, reviewed during the committee meetings and committee structure. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm so excited to have an opportunity to talk about this process in part that we have placed in uh, opportunity for individuals to have individualized re reviews. Some of the things that you asked about, which was evidence of rehabilitation, uh, we are looking at what the person might have done while they were inside. We also have an opportunity to have different people on that particular committee because it is based on the way that we've been doing the family reentry program at NYCHA, which has been very successful in the last five years of looking at individualized opportunities for individuals who've done something on the inside. We are also also very proud that we have somebody who is the guru of criminal justice in understanding what that walk might be back into the community. So we're taking a real keen look on a case by case basis of anybody that falls in that particular category. We also, um, when, when you when we talk about an opportunity to um, have, have that particular evidence, there could be no evidence. It could just be that that person has been out for quite some time and have stayed free away from any criminal justice involvement. So it's, it's not necessarily a criteria that's set in stone that you have to have one year or two years. Once again, it's an opportunity to look at that person, their family setting, their support systems, and all of their social networks, all of the things that we need so that that person can have a strength-based journey back to freedom. Thank you for that. I think the concern might be that it's a little too discretionary and it's going to require some guidance to people to understand what that process looks like and what might be um, helpful to that process to be able to um, to get to get placed into housing. Um, I'll just I'll thank you for that answer. I'll just I'll uh, not to take up much too much time. I'll just pass it over to DOC on the second question. Thank you, Nitra, for answering. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Powers. My name is Francis Torres, and I'm one of the assistant commissioners assigned to the Division of Programs and Community Partnerships. We are happy to share with you, and I thank you for that question, that our counseling staff leads our efforts as a division to ensure vital records, whether it is birth certificates or social security cards for those individuals who are assigned to our care and custody. As you could only imagine the process at times, once the individual has been assisted in the completion of the application, could take approximately 14 weeks to be processed, at which point we could have that person already, already discharged from our custody. I think that is fair to share with you that for FY20, meaning July 2019 and June 2020, we have been able to assist 275 individuals with requesting birth certificates. Thank you. Okay, my last question, 275 out of how many individuals that would be able to be getting a birth certificate? Any individual who has a need for a birth certificate Chair Powers could be in communication with our counseling staff, at which point our counseling staff would initiate the process. Okay, so my, last, so my really last question, how many of the, the, how many, you got 275, how many were you unable to help? Chair, I don't have those numbers right now. We will be more than happy to get that figure to you. Okay, because success rate, that's a, that's a success rate is really more important than the, I think much as important as the other number, but I'll leave it at there. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all the agencies for, for taking time to answer the questions. So I'll hand it back to Chair Lansman. Thank you. Let me just acknowledge um, that we've been joined by Council Member Ayala. Thank you. We will now turn to Chair Levin for questions, uh, followed by questions from the committee members. And just a quick reminder to uh, the other council members, if you have any questions or would like to ask any, please use 
the Zoom rain, raise hand function so that we can call on you in turn. Council member Levin. Starting time. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, my videos. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask a little bit more about um, uh, discharge planning with uh, State Department of Corrections. Um, uh, so, Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater, you you mentioned that you said that it was I'm sorry four percent of uh, in at point in time uh, four percent of individuals in DHS system in the single adult system are um, discharged directly from state DOC. Is that right? No. So this is a this is not a at uh, directly discharged. So the numbers I provided. In August 2020, 4.5% of the single adult census had been in DOC custody in the last year. And then for um, state corrections, as of August 20, 9.3% of the DHS single adult census was on parole. Okay. <clears throat> um, so how many, how many then individuals in, during those point in time? How many, how many? Um... Sure. So, um, and let me, I'll, I'll also, because um, there's some overlap between the groups, so let me give that information as well. So as of August 2020, um, 797 out of 17,621 of the individuals in the DHS census had uh, been in DOC custody in the last year. Um, using that same point in time, August 2020, 9.3% of individuals or 1,600 and 32 individuals out of that same 17,621 of the DHS census was on parole from New York State. And then the overlap between those two groups, so same measurement, August 2020, 11.9% or 2,096 individuals out of the 17,621 um, within our census had been in DOC custody in the last year and or was also on parole. Um, so a couple of things with that. Um, so I know for years, uh, we've been hearing from DHS that one of the biggest issues that we've been seeing in the single adult shelter system is the, um, is that, uh, state DOC has not been, um, has not been effectively, uh, coordinating with them upon discharge. Um, but this is showing that that's about 4% of the single adult shelter population, um, you know, under 1,000 people. Um, so that's, that's not really, uh, you know, percentage-wise really contributing um, a massive amount to that system. Um, also, it, it, it's, it, with that number of, of individuals, we should be able to, um, uh, to to work with that number of people under a thousand people, we should be easily able to work with that. So oh, I I I think that that what's important to remember is that because this is a point in time count, it's representative of only a small subset of the individuals um, who utilize DHS shelter on a particular night. So while we're utilizing an August 2020 point in time count of over 17,000 individuals in the DHS single adult census, that's not representative of the full um, component of individuals that we serve um, on any given night uh, who come to us uh, in need of shelter. Right, no, I'm, I'm more talking about this kind of larger picture of the drive. For years, we've, we've been having this conversation when we've seen a large uptick, or since in the last five years, we've seen a significant uptick in the the number of single adults in the shelter system. Sure. Often DHS has said that the main driver of that is DOC, DOC's um, lack of discharge planning. So we've characterized it as one of many drivers, um, which is which is accurate. Um, it also contributes to, or another driver, as we know, um, is you know lack of affordable housing, evictions, and those sorts of things as well. Um, it is something that we believe would be um, addressed in part um, with additional discharge planning from the state. 
and or if there isn't um, appropriate options other than shelter uh, based on that more robust discharge planning, that the city would be reimbursed for um, the sheltering costs of those individuals. Um, we surpass the adult shelter cap for reimbursement each year. And so looking at other opportunities for reimbursement from the state for the services that we're providing is also something that we're hoping to achieve with that legislation. So, so um, and maybe this is something that, that Mock J could speak to, but what is the, um, what is the, what is our coordination with state DOC um, look like? On a practical level, if if so, it just let's 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 take an example of somebody being discharged from state DOC. What is their what's their engagement prior to discharge with New York City agencies? So I can I certainly speak to that, and uh, as it relates to the individuals that do come into the hotels, because. Uh, to be clear, in the three dedicated reentry hotels that we have, we are currently housing individuals that are released from uh, local uh, DOC custody or from Rikers, mm -hmm. as well as uh, we make beds available to people who are coming um, from state docs facilities. And so, in that regard, uh, you know, we have been. Um, working with them to, uh, you know, link those individuals to the same reentry services that are provided at the hotels, um, understand in advance of their placement, uh, what any, uh, you know, medication or medical needs might be. Um, obviously, if they are an individual that is still on some level of parole supervision, then that is the supervision is something that is you know, provided at the state level, and and that is their responsibility to you know maintain contact with their parole officer. But we do provide those reentry services. I can speak again. This is just specific to people who are coming into the mock day reentry hotels. Uh, others are better able to speak to individuals that are being discharged. I guess my question is like, is there a is there a um, you know a, a, like a a, a, a well established MOU or some type of organizational chart for somebody that's that's being discharged from from state prison to say, okay, this is the city agency that you need to be talking to. This is the city agency that you're going to be you are going to be talking to with regard to your housing. This is the city agency that you are going to be talking to with regard to to your health care. This is the person. We're this is the number. I'm going to call them right now. You know, where's the? Is there is there Relation is there a kind of streamlined relationship between city agencies and state, either parole or DOC, to to actually discharge? Because for years I've heard, oh, state DOC just discharges people into shelter. There's no there's no there's no real planning. And honestly, it's it. I would imagine it's a two way street. We have to the city has to do its part also um, to to make sure that that there is appropriate linkages. If we're talking about at any given time, 700 individuals, that's not 10,000 individuals, it's under a thousand. We could, we could be, you could do proper planning for 700 people at any given time. That's not a, that's not a, a um, that's not a caseload that is beyond comprehension or, you know, like that's, that's, that's workable. But, but where's the structure? I, I don't. I, I'm just, I haven't seen the structure in place to say, okay, this is what we're going to be doing with people as they're being discharged. Here's your here's your healthcare. Here's your housing. Here's your employment. Here's your identification. I, I appreciate that. There's you know we we do a lot of work with people coming out of Rikers. That's important. But I'm really concerned about that. This this coordination and who's going to take responsibility for that. Is, I've, I've just heard for years, oh, it's the state's responsibility, it's the state's responsibility. Where's, the, where's that, that MOU between the city and state that I'm looking for? So I am not personally aware of an MOU uh, between the city and the state on this question. Uh, I do, you know, I, I can share just what I'm aware of, which is that obviously, you know, within uh, State Department of Corrections, they do have, you know, a deputy level who is in charge of reentry and we certain with discharge staff and we certainly 
work closely with individuals in that team um, to make recommendations on services that are available. I know that that individual is also in touch with uh, you know, people from other city and agencies. And I know that a number of the nonprofit service providers that have contracts with the city also have uh, contracts with the state. And we certainly have you know, made a number of our services available to, uh, to those individuals as well. So in terms of specificity and of what mm -hmm. is the literature that's handed out, I'm much more familiar with the literature that we hand out and um, you know, how we coordinate that network uh, for people coming out of local custody. Um, but certainly we um, you know, consider ourselves partners to the state in this effort in that, you know, we're certainly, uh, you know, willing to continue to coordinate with them. I certainly don't know of an MOU that, um, that, that outlines that, but if I uh, can identify one, I will make sure that uh, the council can, can, can see that. Yeah, no, we, I think what I'm saying is I actually want one to be drawn up, but I'll work <laughs> on it with, with you know, we, we could work on it together. This is something that uh, I think that should happen. Um, uh, Chair Lanceman, I'll come back on on second round because I just have another uh, another question. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to questions from council members, beginning with council member Levine, followed by council member Lander. Starting time. Thank you so much. I want to ask questions on one of the bills we're considering today. Uh, which is not directly related to reentry, but I, I just want to express my appreciation to the chair today for your work on this issue and associate my, myself with your comments. But we also are hearing a bill that's critical to protecting tenants and their data privacy. And um, I wonder if Sarah Mallory would be available for a follow-up question or two on HPD's position on that. Yep, just want to confirm. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I'm really happy to hear that HPD supports the goals of the bill. Um, if I'm to understand correctly, uh, you had concerns about um, the practicality of enforcement, and it seems like specifically that it's a, it's a technical area uh, because it's IT related that might be beyond the expertise of HPD. And uh, if that's right, I'm wondering whether uh, we could tap the expertise of another agency like Do It. Um, to make sure that we can accomplish these goals. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, there are conversations around privacy and kind of the retention and storage and collection of data, I think that we also want to have with our chief privacy officer. Um, but working with all those right parties, we definitely want to figure out the, the right enforcement mechanism for this going forward and the right agency to do that. Got it. Is do it currently involved in any enforcement of any existing rules? I cannot speak for do it. Uh, to be honest, I am not the expert in that area, um, but we can get back to you on that. Got it. And the chief uh, privacy officer, uh, uh, do they have any current enforcement duties? Are you aware? Uh, not that I know of, but same thing. I'm not the expert there, so I would have to get, get back to you on that. Okay. Um, I mean, this is probably worthy of an offline conversation. Uh, I think that if there's agreement on the goals, and expertise within city government, though perhaps not within HPD, that there's a way we can bring all the right parties to the table uh, to pass legislation which will protect tenants in an evolving landscape where their data on building entry is uh, frankly exposed and we want to protect their privacy, uh, their safety, uh, and while offering them the convenience that some of these systems do offer. So um, I'm going to pause there to pass it back to the chairs for more time for my colleagues and advocates um, and uh, thank the administration for their uh, general support and to my colleagues, the chairs, for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Lander. Starting time. Thank you very much uh, to all the chairs and everyone who's testifying for this important hearing. Um, I also just, um, I'm gonna ask my questions about the legislation as well, but I really wanna appreciate the work that is being done by our chairs for oversight and the work that's being done by agencies. This is just absolutely critically important. 
Um, and I'll just, of, of one tidbit that got thrown in, I, I am, was really glad to see the Where We Live report finally released. That has been a long time coming. Um, obviously, it's important on the issue of providing uh, housing for folks who are returning from prison or jail, uh, but it's broadly critical for the future of the city, so I'm glad it's released. Um, but I want to ask my question also about this issue of tenant privacy. Um, I support uh, Councilmember Levine's bill, and I hope we'll move forward with it. Um, but I want to ask um, Ms. Mallory, about a year ago, we had a hearing on this topic more broadly of tenant security and tenant privacy. Um, Council Member Levine's bill would require a set of protocols to make sure that we protect any data that's collected on tenants by owners who use biometric scanning or other ga data gathering sources. Um, about a year ago, we had a hearing on my bill, Intro 1758, that would require landlords to provide a physical or mechanical key to tenants. So if they wish to avoid having to use a keyless fob or biometric or something that would track their whereabouts altogether, they'd be able to do so. And at that time, on October 7th, 2019, you indicated HPD's support of the bill, that you support maintaining requirements for manual lock and key sets. Um, and I just want to uh, ask if that continues uh, to be true. Yes, absolutely. Well, first, I want to say thank you for your support of where we live. We are very excited to have that report done, and you've been a real strong champion of that for a long time. So thank you for that. And then additionally, that is correct, and testified um, about a year ago uh, in support of that bill. And yes, we do support kind of codifying HPD's existing practice to require that a key and lock set be required in addition to any um, kind of fob or electronic system. That's great. And I'll just make clear, these things in my mind go together very well. It's not one or the other where people do put in place security systems that gather data. There must be privacy standards to protect tenants, and I want to uh, appreciate Councilmember Levine's bill introducing them. Uh, but if we also require landlords to provide a lock and key, then those people who want to go one step further and say, I'm going to find a way not to have my data tracked at all, I will wear you know, glasses that obscure or do what's necessary to protect my privacy, could still get in and out of their homes without being subjected against their will to it. So it's great to hear HPD still support, the administration still supports that bill. Um, and I look forward to working with Councilmember Levine and the chairs so that we can pair these together uh, to protect tenant privacy to the, to the full extent possible. So thank you very much for the opportunity to ask my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing that there are no other council member questions, we will return to the chairs for another round of questions from them. Each chair will once again have 10 minutes to ask questions, beginning again with Chair Lansman. Thank you. Um, this is for Jamie Thank Nichols. You, at, thank you. This is for Jamie Nichols at um, the OHMH, I think. You, you had indicated that there's no satisfactory response had been received on the RFP for development of the JISH units, despite the RFP being live for almost a year at this point. Can you explain that a bit more? What are the, the, the attributes that DOHMH is looking for that would qualify as a satisfactory response? And, and what are your expectations for how the Corporation for Supportive Housing may be, may be able to help specifically? So the RFP has various sections around um, experience of an organization that is responding, as well as their plan to implement the, the model as it's um, been um, developed thus far and been successful. And so there's scoring criteria associated with each um, section in the response and a group of subject matter experts um, reviews the proposals um, according to very strict rules so that there's no bias in our review process. Um, and their scores were below um, the minimum thresholds that we've set to make an award. We're planning, do you want me to take the second part? Yeah. Yes, please. Sure, we're taking, a, we're planning a, a webinar in um, November um, to invite justice service providers um, who, um, frankly, may have been you know, busy or distracted by the pandemic over the last year um, to you know, pay renewed attention to this um, opportunity to ask questions, learn more about the successes from providers thus far, um, and get some um, guidance about how they can respond through the city's procurement system. 
were the organizations that, how, how many responses did you get? There was one complete response. Just one. That's strange. You know, I think we convened on uh, providers before we wrote the RFP. I agree, it is strange. Um, we convened providers before we issued the RFP to get input. Um, we had a really um, great participation in that meeting last probably, you know, fall sometime. Um, lots of, you know, interest and excitement and input into the development. Um, so, you know, we too were surprised by the limited response. I, you know, I really think the pandemic is a factor here. Mm. All right. And, and you've been in touch with the, the universe of, of potential legitimate providers to, to maybe see what is this your surmise or have you spoken to folks and said, hey, we thought we would have thought you would have submitted uh, a response, a bid? So, you know, I think, you know, I, as, a, as, a, as a contractor, I need to be careful about the kinds of, you know, conversations I have with providers um, and, and not sort of giving any unfair advantage. Um, but there have certainly been um, reminders um, sent out automatically generated through the city's procurement systems to providers. And um, we, uh, I think there was a noted, you know, decline in responses to RFPs overall in the city. Um, I've heard that from other sources. That's not my information directly. So I don't think this is unique to, to just Jish. Right. Maybe, um, is there anything Mock Jake could add? Maybe Mock Jake, you know, is in a position to have more direct conversations with the universe of, of providers. Obviously, I mean, I don't mean to be glib, but just like, sending the same thing out that got the, the same poor response last time, probably not the best strategy. Yeah, I mean, I agree. We don't wanna, you know, try the same thing and expect different outcomes, which is why we're, you know, working with a, a third party to, to host this webinar in November. Okay. Mock J, is there anything that can be done other than, than the webinar? So I, un I, I unfortunately have not had conversations with providers specific to the JISH RFP. But obviously, we're you know we we also uh, share the desire for there to be uh, a better response, and so we're happy to work with Jamie and others to, you know, do what we can to increase that response rate. But um, I have not communicated with providers on Jish specifically. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now turn to Chair Ambry Samuel. Starting time. Thanks again. Um, you know, I felt the need to just kind of frame my question um, to make sense of the like the why. Um, so, in 2018, some 3,400 plus people were released from state prison and went directly to the shelters in New York City. 15,000 people went into the New York City shelter systems between 2015 and 2018. That's an average of 5,000 people per year. And I want to highlight that because when we look at the state prison system, mo a majority of the people are from my district. And so when I'm asking about, you know, numbers that are related to folks coming home, and being able to return to their families, it's because in my district office, in my New York City Council district office, this is a constituency matter. I receive phone calls and people knocking on our doors on a weekly basis. And the conversation is, my son has been incarcerated for 20 years and he is coming home next month. And I wanna know, how you can help me either find a place for my child or how can they return to my apartment in NYCHA. So this is a real legit constituent service issue for me and my family, my friends and the people in my district and in public housing. So I wanted to frame that question. So when I'm asking about numbers, it's because I need to know, because I need to answer these questions when we get these constituent services issues and I wanna be able to provide information, resources and solutions. And so I am going to continue with my questions related to permanent exclusion. And then 
as a lead up, hoping that I'll be able to get some information. Then we can go into the amazing work that Yolanda Johnson Peterkin is doing so we can figure out how to be able to assist and scale up. Okay? So returning back to the questions. How many families were able to request to have a permanent exclusion case lifted? And with that, can you just talk about the process of when a resident would like to have their case or their, their, their loved one, ex, um, the exclusion lifted? And then if there's any attorneys present at that time. Sure, absolutely. But just talk about the process for us. Absolutely. And Councilwoman, just so you know, at the end of this, we can circle back and I was able to get those numbers for you. Uh, but to your, to your question at hand, just to speak to the process. So the permanent exclusion lift program was established a few years ago to provide a pathway for folks to have a permanent exclusion lifted. So um, on our website, you can find um, application forms that need to be completed um, by the person who desires to return home. Um, there's two pathways uh, to having their permanent exclusion lifted. One is passage of time, and the other one are um, a change of circumstances and um, evidence of rehabilitation that can be shown. Um, once those forms are submitted and reviewed, um, we have had a number of folks uh, successful in closing their, uh, their permanent exclusion. So to your question on the numbers, um, in uh, 2017, there were 60 applications for a PE closure, 36 of those were granted. 24 were denied. In 2018, there were 83 applications, 60 were granted, 22 denied, one moot, and I can explain what that means in just a moment. In 2019, there were 83 applications, 62 were granted, 20 denied, one moot. And then 2020 year to date, there were 23 applications, 19 were granted, four denied. Um, of the cases uh, excluded in 2017, 2018, and 2019, those recent cases, um, we've only had about uh, five lifted just because uh, the passage of time has not happened. So um, they're either not eligible yet or the tenant has not applied. And just to clarify those two cases that I mentioned that we have described here as moot, it means that the individual applied um, when they were not eligible. And then as the appeal process progressed and time passed, they became eligible. Um, so the initial application was moot because the passage of time meant that they were eligible. So just as a quick follow up, let's just go to 2017, the 60 applicants, um, 24 were denied. Can you just speak to the 24 that were denied? Like why would a family be denied? I know you just mentioned a few things, but can you just speak to the 20? 24 seems like a high number to me. Sure. So they can be for a variety of reasons. So one could be um, that there enough time has not passed, that they're within um, look back periods. So they're not eligible because they haven't met that standard of passage of time since the offenses. Um, another could be that there's not enough um, mitigating evidence or documentation provided in order to lift um, the exclusion. Um, it also could be that the tenant of record does not want the person to return home. Okay, and so with that, were, were any of the residents um, represented by an attorney during the process at all? So we do have residents um, who are represented by attorneys. Unfortunately, we do not track um, the number of residents who are represented. It's not something that's tracked. It would need to be volunteered information by the residents. Okay, is there evidence that demonstrates that increasing permanent exclusion is an effective strategy to decrease crime in public housing. So can you just speak to just the policy itself? Sure, absolutely. So um, again, the permanent exclusion policy is a big part of why we are pursuing the, um, the current effort to modernize our policies. Um, we know that there's a lot of changes that are desired. Um, right now, the permanent exclusion policy has been used as a potential solution, a stipulation that is offered to the tenant of record as a way to preserve their tenancy and remove the person who um, is involved in the criminal justice system. Um, but we know that 
um, this is something that can also have negative impacts on a household. Um, and also that there has been feedback on the PE lift process. And so all of those reasons, it's out for public comment right now. And we do hope if there are other solutions, if there's other alternatives to this, it would be helpful to hear of them. Okay. All right. So thank you so much. I just want to just make a quick comment um, um, before I go to Yolanda um, that, you know, I, I keep hearing about substance abuse, chemical dependency, and, um, you know, in relating that to um, evictions and exclusions. And, you know, I think that we are clearly at a time where we cannot at all criminalize substance abuse. We cannot at all criminalize um, that it, it, it just goes totally against everything that we've been talking about with mental health and, and health issues and health disparities in our communities. And so to even have that in the same conversation is just so archaic. And um, that is a key point that I wanted to, um, to put out there. And so in the little bit of time that I have remaining, and I might have to go to a third, y'all, excuse me, um, or just give me some leeway here. Um, I want to now speak directly to Yolanda Johnson Peterkin. I know you are an amazing leader in Niger and have been doing some amazing work as it relates to um, the reentry program. Um, so, can you just describe the Vera Institute for Justice Family Reentry Program and um, just how many applicants mm -hmm. apply to be a part of that program um, and how many were accepted? And, um, you know, were there any folks that reentered NYCHA and joined the lease but had to, like, if they, uh, went back to prison. So can you just give us some numbers and just talk about the, the program itself? Because we're just trying to make sure that, um, you know, just trying to get a sense of, is it working? And like, what can we do to scale up? Thank you, Chair Samuel. I appreciate that. So I'm always excited to talk about family reentry. Family reentry is an opportunity for people to uh, reunify with their family in public housing, in NYCHA, um, uh, uh, public housing in our facilities uh, with their family, but they must be the direct family, mother, father, sister, brother. That's the rule of NYCHA in New York City. Um, stepmother, stepfather has to be the first line of family. Uh, we have had uh, a lot of success in the, it's been in existence for seven years, but five operational, two was planning and et cetera. Um, well, six, about six. And so from the time that family reentry started, given formerly incarcerated people who have three years or less um, or are currently incarcerated, and I really want to be able to reach out to those individuals that are doing 20 years and want to move back in with their parents or their, their family members, um, those are the individuals that we are looking for. We have taken into the program over the last five years. Um, the numbers I, I have are from 2017. Uh, we In 2017, it was one sorry, 53 applicants, 2018, 28 applicants, 2019, 31 applicants, 2020, unfortunately it's COVID, we only had eight. But of those numbers, um, the people who were accepted into the program um, in 2017 was, uh, excuse me a second. Time expired. Sorry, 2017 was 29, I'm sorry, 28 out of the 53, 15 out of the 28, 15 out of the the, um, 31 and 13, that's because some of them probably was in December and we accepted them in January in 2020. So, but please understand that we accept the application doesn't mean that it's the family member or they actually want the person to live back. But what we have done is that we've had 287 to date people apply and we have accepted 160. Five as of, as of today, and of those numbers, um, you wanted to know of those numbers. Now, eighty seven of those numbers withdrew, meaning that it was not a family member. For some reason, we got the application from our providers, but it wasn't really a match for the program because that's no, we didn't deny that many people. Eighty seven took their applications back, but the the wonderful number is that of that one hundred and um um sixty two. Uh, 116 have completed the program. Um, 20 of them are in progress of getting on the lease. 31 are on the lease. 58 have moved out with their other loved ones. And uh, two of them have bought houses. Yes, some in, in Brownsville. And uh, unfortunately, three was arrested after they completed the program. So they did the two years. And then after they completed the program, they were arrested. And some of our uh, individuals are going on to rat and pack. So that means that the, 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 
development has turned into a rat or pack development and they've had an opportunity to stay and move in with their family but we don't actually count them in public housing so all uh, and, and, and the, the bigger number is 287 165 uh, or 88 165 um uh, we have accepted and of that in five years only six have been rearrested and went back to prison. So we know that when we put people back with their family, they have a, a opportunity to stay on the freedom journey. How do you just real quick? How do you measure proof that it actually that is actually working? Like, um, you know, can you just speak to like a success story and to say that you know um, we have this amount of people working at NYCHA within this unit, mm -hmm. working with these families, and you know, and because of that, we know that you know we're out. We, you know, we can we can scale up to 500 families, you know, um, based on the numbers that we've seen. So can you just give us like a quick summary? So in summary, we are very excited because we will be partnering with Mock J to get some funding. You know that NYCHA does not do their own applications, they process applications. So we have the gurus out there on the vineyard working and looking for individuals. They're in the facilities, outside the facilities, making sure that we're in the, um, in the developments, making sure that we're putting out the word that people can live um, in, in public housing with their family. Unfortunately, it, we have been shifting that, that myth for a very long time. Time, five years and it's probably going to take us another five but we have individuals who are who graduated from the family reentry program that are working at NYCHA they're also telling their stories as well but the best story that I know that I can talk about is the individual who unfortunately he, he reunified with his mom and they had a great time and all things were well he had got an opportunity to spend four years with her before she passed um, he did join the lease. So after she passed, he had an opportunity to take over that apartment, you know, to stay the remaining family member, although he had done something 12 years ago that he was not so proud of. What that turned into is that the other elders of that building and the people that knew his mom then started to rely on him to help them during COVID. And uh, he was out helping them and delivering food and all of that stuff. So we know that individuals that want to turn their life around, they, even if it's not their parents, they will give back to our communities when we allow them to come back in the community and serve. So we, in, we encourage our uh, participants to serve, to give back to, to the developments and the areas, and that's what it takes. Now, the way that we scale up is to get with Mark J and allow our uh, providers, our community providers who do the best work to make sure that they're helping us get that word out. And I know that we will be able to get these numbers up with that type of support. We currently have three individuals on the unit. We had two, now we have another one. But when we get ready to scale up, I'm sure that I can say that NYCHA is going to be supportive of, uh, on, uh, of staff on the inside to make sure that we are able to meet those numbers. And thank you. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Thank you for that information. Um, and I'll end there. Thank you. We'll now turn back to Chair Carnegie. Starting time. Uh, thank you again for this second round. Um, I am going to, again, uh, stay uh, with the fiscal questions. Um, I have some enhanced post-release reentry service questions. Uh, can you please provide an update on the implementation of Mock J's enhanced post-release reentry services contracts? Yeah, so I'll start and then I think Anna can provide more uh, detailed information. So essentially uh, that solicitation was to a more comprehensive community-based reentry network uh, and the uh, awardees were the groups that I referenced in my testimony. Um, there were uh, one awardee for each borough and then a few awardees that were citywide um, the citywide was particularly so that we could also ensure that there was some organizations that had particular expertise in serving women as well as young adults. Uh, there will also be a range of subcontracted organizations. And in particular, one of the things that the RFP uh, had specified was a number of uh, target neighborhoods where we knew that there were the you know, significant numbers of people that were coming home um, to these neighborhoods and of the importance of having those localized services, um, as well as a wide range of spe specialized supports, uh, services that were relevant, for instance, to the LGBTQ 
community um, and you know a, a wide range such as that. So uh, we will be working with the vendors uh, to finalize these contracts um, and the services themselves will be online in January 2021 in the interim. Uh, and you know, I'll acknowledge that that process was a little bit delayed from what we had anticipated was the original start date as a result of COVID. And so we did amend um, some of the existing jails to jobs contracts uh, so that we didn't have a gap of in services, uh, of course, um, wanted to ensure that there were things you know, such as, for instance, now we're providing more essential supplies, um, cell phones, metro cards, things like that, that we've made sure are available right now so that, again, we have some additional services um, before the new RFP comes on the street. Uh, but, um, Anna, if there's anything, and, and I should just specify that, again, those additional services that are uh, targeting NYCHA residents are part of that. And that is what Yolanda was speaking about and what we certainly hope will be an opportunity to ensure that some of our service providers can work with uh, NYCHA residents in particular to make them aware of how to go about you know, applying for this um, reunification program and, and the other pathways um, back to housing available for them. So that is certainly a component of this. Um, and, and if there's anything that I didn't add um, or I didn't say, please feel free to add. No, I, I think that was very comprehensive. Um, we're just very excited to, to get to work um, and bring services online by the new year. So um, I'm apologizing because I didn't count along as you were listing the providers. I know you said one per borough and then you mentioned some more. What's the actual number of those providers? It's 10. Okay. Did, and then did, a whole host of subcontracts. Right. Okay. Uh, how many people do you do, do you well, do you know the number of the amount of people who've been served by the providers with new contracts by any chance, or are you saying that those contracts really haven't been implemented due to COVID? They have they haven't been implemented yet. Uh, many are the same providers from jails to jobs, but these new contracts won't launch until January. Got it. Got it. Uh, can you please provide the committee with the budget or contract information uh, for these providers? We can do that offline. I'll ask that question offline. Uh, and additionally, please work with OMB to provide the committees with the, indig the indigent defense and criminal justice contracts reconciliation that's still outstanding for fiscal year 21. We will follow up on that. Okay, thank you. That, that uh, I yield the remainder of my time. Great. If there's any. Thank you. We will now turn back to Council uh, Chair Powers. Starting time. I have no follow up questions. I'm happy to pass this along to, uh, to other folks who will answer questions. Thank you. We'll turn to Chair Levin. Thank you. Starting uh, time. Thank you. So, I, uh, looking back uh, through our committee report, and um, Chair Amprey Samuel mentioned this that in 2018, according to Coalition for the Homeless, 3,400 people were released from state prisons directly into the shelter system in 2018. Um, but uh, Deputy Commissioner Trinkwater, you said that um, approximately 750 um, at a point in time were uh, residing in, in August of 2020. Is that right? Steve, I need you to look over your shoulder, buddy. I know, I know. I just said keep them occupied. That's the goal here. <laughs> um, I, I believe the report you're referencing is uh, the state docs number. Um, that 797 number is individuals who have been in DOC, city DOC custody within the last year. So I want to be careful that we're not missing, oh, we're not matching apples city, and oranges. City DOC, so not state DOC. Correct. So the state, the, the state docs number, um, the point in time count for August 2020 is 1,632 individuals um, were in the DHS census on parole. Right, but on parole is is does that mean that they're that they were discharged directly to a, a New York City shelter? No, so I don't. So the discharge directly numbers I don't have with me today. Um, that would be something that uh, would require a manual data poll um, from our teams. Um, I'd have to get back to the committee um, as to what's possible in pulling the direct discharge number. Okay. Um, is it? 
appropriate to assume that if somebody is on parole and in the shelter system, they were directly discharged to shelter? If they're on parole, they not necessarily, they could, they could be paroled to another address and then come to shelter. Mm -hmm. um, but the likelihood is that somebody has been directly discharged. Now, okay, so even so, we would be looking at a difference of about 2,000 individuals in a year that were, um, uh, were according to the 3,400 number in 2018, according to Coalition for the Homeless. I, 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 what I'm concerned about is just a kind of, that we don't seem to have a, um, a clear, you know, a clear accounting. Do we know how many people have been dis uh, how in the last, in one year were discharged to, um, to, uh, to three quarters houses or are re currently residing in three quarters houses? Sorry for the distraction here. No, it, 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 you're totally fine. Um, so in terms of the, the discharges, um, I can certainly let colleagues from Mock Day address the, the discharge from docs, uh, address the city issues. Um, for shelter, we don't always know somebody's criminal history um, because it's not, it's not a data point unless somebody's on parole that we would, we would necessarily know about. So somebody's not disclosing that, they, that information. They were discharged, though, you wouldn't know that they were directly discharged from state DOC. So that's what, that's the exception that I said. If they were, if they're coming to us to, and discharged directly on parole from state docs. Okay, but so you, I, I guess what I, my question is, you have a point in time count. You have, uh, and then you also must have um, a kind of annualized count. And there's a difference between the annualized count and the point in time count. Where are, where are those people going? If they're no longer in shelter, where have they gone? They gone to three quarters houses? So they could exit um, on their own. They could exit. But where are um, they gonna go exiting on their own? There's no, there's no, there's, it's, it's, they can't go to NYCHA. They can't move in with their families. They're discriminated against by landlords. Where are they going? I mean, there's really not a lot of options for people. So we don't disagree, which is why we've advocated for an increase to the state set shelter allowance, why we've advocated for things like home stability to support and why we've worked with our colleagues in um, DOC and MOCJ in terms of the just supportive housing and the particular dedicated resources for this particular population. Um, okay, I, I, I wanna just uh, call uh, the administration's attention, they testified in support of 2047. This is a piece of legislation that I'm in, introduced um, and hopefully we'll see passed, which would um, make illegal um, criminal background checks by private landlords. My hope is that, um, that that moves forward and passes, but I would also like to make sure that uh, both NYCHA and HPD uh, uh, affordable housing uh, is also um, follows that um, those parameters. Um, if we make it absolutely illegal um, to do a criminal background check on somebody uh, uh, for a private hous housing application, uh, there's no reason in the world why at least HPD um, and, and NYCHA within everything in their power to, um, uh, to, 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 uh, do it in a more blanket way and not and not with a kind of piecemeal way. And I'll go back on mute because kids are raising a ruckus. Uh, thank you, Council Member. From the HPD perspective, we're absolutely interested in looking at that further. Um, we already have done limitations um, in our housing portfolio to kind of limit what um, marketing agents and developers can look at in backgrounds, including criminal backgrounds. And so we'd be happy to consider that for our portfolio as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Who's next? Um, if Chair Levin is, uh, finished with his questions for this round, we'll turn back to committee members for questions. 
um, at five minutes each, beginning with Council Member Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Uh, I, I, I actually have a question for, uh, for Sarah at HPD about uh, Council Member uh, Levine's bill. Uh, I, I like this bill, and I, but I'm not a sponsor, and my concern has been um, about uh, people in rent stabilization who are really not entitled to rent stabilization, who are not where the, that apartment is not their primary apartment. Uh, and we're making it so that the landlord can't use the coming and going data uh, as in, in, a, in, in an eviction proceeding. And, you know, obviously with the tremendous shortage of affordable housing. Uh, so I'm curious if you're concerned about the HPD portfolio uh, and people in the HPD apartments who may not really be entitled to be there. That's a great question. I will say them anecdotally, and this is all subject to uh, our colleagues at the state level and at DHCR who are working on this through rent regulation. I will say anecdotally, what we have heard is that there is more concern from the tenants and concern from them on the landlords who have their private information. Um, but I would kind of have to circle back with my colleagues at the state level in order to get back to you on that. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm interested in it. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions from other council members, we will return to Chair Amprey Samuel for some additional questions. Hi, just to clarify, um, Aaron, you mentioned, um, I asked a question about what is the average age of individuals who are excluded. Um, are you able to now give me the youngest person? And, oh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Absolutely. And I can clarify back on the previous line of questioning the other um, stats that you were looking for. Okay. So to start, um, we were able to get the youngest and oldest individuals with a permanent exclusion. So the youngest was just under 17 years old. It was 16.9 years. The oldest was 73 years old. Okay. Okay. I, um, I just received a text message where someone's sibling was excluded at the age of 14 and um, he's excluded for the rest of his life. Can you speak to how a 14 year old could be excluded for the rest sure. of their life? So um, without knowing the circumstances of that case, I can speak more broadly to the policy and thank you for raising it. Um, one of the things that has been put out for public comment and a recommendation is actually setting a minimum age for permanent exclusion, um, because as you mentioned, that's a very young age. Um, so what NYCHA has put out as a recommendation is setting a minimum age of 18 for permanent exclusion. Again, it's open for public comment. We would like to hear from members of the public, from residents about what they feel is appropriate. Um, but, uh, you know, in addition to the case you're raising, um, permanent exclusion is the name and um, as it stands now, uh, is a permanent program unless that person applies for a lift. So um, in the event that they have, um, have fit one of those two pathways I mentioned earlier, either passage of time or change in circumstances, they would be able to apply for the permanent exclusion lift program. Again, I don't know all the circumstances, but that should be available to the individual you're mentioning. And the other thing that has been put out for public comment is that um, at the end of a five-year period, as long as that person has um, remained crime-free and the tenant of record would like them to return home, that would be um, automatically closed. So that PE would automatically close at the end of five years. So some of the, um, the recommendations that have been put out for public comment right now actually would address um, the case that you just raised, um, both on the minimum age as well as a time period for closure. And I do just want to mention, should I go through some of the yes. other numbers? Okay, perfect. Okay. So from your previous line of questioning, um, so in 2017, there were 7,241 total cases open. Um, there were of those 1,502 were opened as non-desirability cases. Um, of those, at least 1,223 nine um, were open due to criminal activity. Okay, what does desirability mean real quick? 
So non-desirability cases um, are essentially cases that are open that um, often permanent exclusion is one of the stipulations offered, um, but it can be any uh, breach of the lease. Um, often it's non, it's unrelated to non-payment of rent, but it could be related to criminal justice involvement, some other breach of lease, um, concerns for community safety, things like that. Okay, continue. In 2018, there were 5,247 total cases opened. Um, 1,338 were opened as non-desirability cases. At least 1,126 were due to criminal activity. In 2019, there were 6,244 total cases open. 1,363 of those were opened as non-desirability cases. Of those, at least 1,166 were due to criminal activity. Um, in 2020, um, as of October 16th, um, so it's a year to date as of, I think, last week, um, 4,041 total cases were opened. Um, as of that date, 885 cases were opened based on criminal activity. Um, those are, yeah, so those are those stats. Okay, thank you so much. I just thank wanted you. to, to um, just clarify. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, um, before we conclude. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Council, I just have uh, 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 two more quick questions, if that's okay. Sure, this thank is, uh, you. Um, I just wanted to ask about the uh, the phones that are distributed uh, through the Mache, um, um free phone program. How many phones were distributed? Uh, Anna, do you have a number of the amount of phones that we've distributed to date? Hi, sorry, I had trouble unmuting. Um, I can get you updates on an exact number. Um, what I can say is that um, we began issuing the phones during the bail reform period last year. Um, so in the late fall um, through, through the present really is, is when we began that, that phone distribution program. Um, and that all individuals at the hotels who have been in need of a phone have been able to receive phones. Um, not always on the day that they are admitted to the hotel program, but, um, but all individuals who are at the hotels who need phones have been able to be issued phones. Um, I, can give, I can work on getting you the total um, over you know, the life cycle of both the hotel program and the bail reform program. Is it a, um, is it a pilot have... or is it a, a baseline funding source and how much is it, how much is a how much is it per phone and how much um, is, would it be overall to meet the, the real need that's out there? Sure, thank you for that question. It's a really important one. Um, I don't have those specifics in front of me today, but again, we can get back to you on that. Um, the phones are a piece of the reentry RFP, which will be launched, um, as we've said, in January of 20. 21, um, and we'll be negotiating with each provider um, to propose the number of phones that they will need based on the number of people that they will serve um, and to come up with the best price um, per, per unit, which is how we've done it historically. Um, but again, can get you some, some background documentation on that because it is such a critical piece. And then my last question for, uh, for Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater, just a quick question about the uh, uh, the the status of sweeps, and I know that it's not exactly the topic that we're uh, discussing today, but um, is is DSS currently working with uh, NYPD on sweeps? I know that there was supposed to be, as part of the budget this year, a um, you know dissolution of any uh, working arrangement or or uh, MOU with DSS and, and NYPD. Is 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 there a current working relationship with regard to sweeps? That, that, did you hear that question? Oh, Aaron, I think that you are muted. 
There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, I So yes, that's correct. The budget uh, dissolved the NYPD HOU unit. Um, the teams have been working um, to uh, determine our how we're working to engage our street clients, um, both balancing uh, the need for public safety and individuals to, you know, be able to pass sidewalks and things like that. Um, our role in the joint uh, efforts uh, is to be there to provide individuals uh, connections to the social services resources. Uh, DSNY continues um, to clean debris and so forth. Um, and we are working to issue um, updated information about that work. Um, NYPD is not involved um, in, in those joint operations. Um, there are times uh, that um, there is, uh, things are escalated due to um, individuals either um, not keeping a clear walkway um, or otherwise. Um, typically what will happen um, is that cleanup does not occur and we'll continue to work uh, to engage the individuals through social services channels to connect them uh, to services uh, and to work to bring them inside. Um, and then, I'm sorry, uh, um, back to Mach J just for one more question about the phones. Is the, cur is the program still currently in effect? Are we still giving out phones to uh, people discharged from, from yes. Rikers? That is yes. happening right now? Yes. Okay, and it has no, there's no plans to discontinue this program? Correct. We, we quite the opposite. We, uh, <laughs> we believe in this program. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I believe this concludes council member questioning. So we will now turn to testimony from members of the public. Please listen for your name as I'll be calling on individuals one by one and we'll also announce the person who is next. Once your name is called, please accept the prompt to unmute yourself and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. We will start with testimony from Mike McKee followed by Thomas Edwards and Rebecca Engel. Mike? Good afternoon, uh, council Good afternoon, council members, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of Intro 1760. Um, this is a very important bill. Uh, it's new territory for everyone, including me. Um, and it's been kind of striking to me that nowhere in the entire country, it seems, has any jurisdiction enacted any kind of legislation to deal with this this question. There are bills pending I'm aware of in the state legislature dealing with data privacy, but uh, none of them has passed. Um, so this is um, a very important bill uh, and and many of us, including myself, are uh, grappling to master the details. Um, it's an ex these are exciting technological advances. Uh, they're also very dangerous unless there are curbs on their use. So we're, I'm not saying we should not allow these uh, technological changes to take place. I'm just saying that there has to be some um, curb on how landlords can use this. Um, this really is the wild west. There's no law governing what landlords can do with these data. Um, I do, I'm not going to read my statement, obviously, in two minutes, but uh, I also have um, a couple of concerns about how to improve the bill. Most importantly, I believe that this, the language uh, barring any eviction attempts based on the use of this um, information should be strengthened. Um, I heard Council Member Cohen's concern about a non-primary residence case. I believe that is misdirected. Uh, and I think um, it is essential that tenants' privacy uh, uh, rights be uh, preserved and that they be protected from harassment and from eviction attempts. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see we have a question from Council Member Cohen. Is that for this panelist? It is. He sort of, he already alluded to it. How are you, Mike? It's good to see you. Uh, uh, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I, I guess, though, I mean, I'm sure we both share a concern about, um, you know, with the shortage, obviously, of rent stabilized units. I, I don't know how big a problem non primary is, um, uh, but I, I am sort of, I, I just don't like the idea of people who are living in Florida, uh, you know, using a rent stabilized apartment that we're so in, in such desperate need of. 
Uh, you, you don't obviously don't share that concern. Could you just ex expand a little bit as to why? That's incorrect. I do share the concern. Uh, the purpose of rent regulation is not to provide a pied a terre for people who live in Connecticut or where else, wherever else, and want to come into the city uh, once a month to go to the theater. Ha uh ha, -huh. as if that were an option right now. Um, but it, and if you listen to the real estate lobby, it's a big, big problem. I think it is absolutely a very small problem. Um, and the other thing to say about this is that with the changes in state law from last year, these cases have virtually disappeared. There's really no incentive for a landlord to go after a tenant on grounds of non-primary residence because they can't jump the rent the way they used to be able to do. The apartment remains rent stabilized. So these cases, which are very complicated, very costly for tenants to defend. I mean, a non-primary residence uh, proceeding costs tenants a huge amount of money if they don't have access to free attorneys. Uh, these are expensive cases to prosecute. Uh, and they, all of my attorney friends tell me they've essentially disappeared, as have indeed cases um, where the landlord claims he wants the apartment for himself or a member of his family member. In my experience, 75% of those cases, 90% of those cases, those owner use cases were fraudulent. The landlord simply was trying to deregulate the apartment, claiming that he wanted a family member to move in. Uh, and those cases have thankfully pretty much disappeared as well. Uh, you know what? I got to tell you, that was uh, very clarifying for me. I really appreciate that. If the landlord doesn't have any incentive uh, to bring the action because he's not going to be able to, that the, the action has gone away, essentially. That's a uh, 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 I, I also want to emphasize that in my experience, and I've been doing this work for 50 years this last August, um, the overwhelming majority of non-primary residence cases are invalid. They are attempts at harassment um, where landlords do things like installing cameras outside somebody's apartment uh, door, which is unfortunately legal. As long as you don't photograph the interior of the apartment, you can photograph the hallway. And it's a very intimidating and annoying thing for a lot of tenants. Um, so I'm not unhappy that these cases uh, have disappeared. Uh, I think it's a very small, very small problem in terms of the overall universe. Uh, although I, I certainly do not believe that uh, rent regulated apartments uh, should be held as pied a terre for uh, people who don't really want to live, live there. I'm not talking about people who might have a vacation home and live part of the year there or something like that. I'm talking about people who are not really living in the apartment. I think you've convinced me. Uh, thank you very much, Chairs. I appreciate it. Thank you. I believe we also have a question from Chair Power. I, I assume that means you'll now, you know, sponsor the bill. Thank you. I think I am gonna I think I am gonna sign on. I mean, I know I don't know if that's gonna push it over the top, but yes. I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, never underestimate the power of Mike McKee and uh, the power of a persuasive argument with Andy Cohen. So uh, um, I was, I mean, I, I don't think that I was going to just echo what Mike McKee says. I know in my neighborhood in Stives in town, folks who are for years getting harassed and the non-primary residence issue was the one being used. And there were instances, for, for instance, where a couple got divorced, one moved to another home and they went after them on a non-primary residence or on somebody inherited a uh, parents' home or something like that, and then they went after them. It was a major form of tenant harassment in here. It's actually subsided a lot, but was a real way to try to um, separate people from their rent regulated apartments. Um, but uh, on that on that issue, um, Mike, I just want to ask you a more global question here, which is impact of COVID on rent regulation apartments. Being that this non primary residence issue, people may have um, you know moved out of uh, the city for a time to be safe from COVID or uh, it could be a young New Yorker who has a newer rent regulated apartment and moves home with the parents or um, other issues like that. Um, and second is the overall um, impact of vacancies on the rent regulation stock and what that might have, what impact that has. Can you just tell me what, you, you know, what you're hearing or seeing or what the thoughts are on? Um, you know, this is a yeah. complicated question and my answer will, if you really want to get into it, it's going to have to be a, a few minutes long because it's something I think about a lot and I talk about a lot and I'm very knowledgeable about. Let me just point out, first of all, that 
the city council needs to focus on one very important upcoming deadline, which is that normally you would be getting the results from the housing and vacancy survey from the Census Bureau sometime, or well, certainly by February. But because of the decennial census, the US Census Bureau has not been able to do the uh, housing and vacancy survey this year. Uh, the Legal Aid Society persuaded uh, the assembly to include a provision in this year's state budget that was passed back in April, in March, April, to give you a year's grace, meaning you need to act before March 31st to extend the city rent control and the city rent stabilization laws for one year. You would normally do a three-year extender, but everything's being pushed back a year um, for uh, to allow the Census Bureau to do the housing and vacancy survey next year, which means you will act in 2022. I'm, I would much prefer you act on this now or, or soon rather than wait until March. I see no reason to, to wait. Uh, and I think it's something that the housing committee in particular should focus on. Now on the question of the vacancy uh, rate itself, uh, there is no question that we have, uh, the, the vacancy rate, especially in Manhattan has risen as people have either given up market rate or regulated or other apartments and moved out of the city, whether temporarily or permanently remains to, to be seen. And let me remind you that the housing and vacancy survey does not simply measure the vacancy rate of rent regulated housing to determine if there's a vacancy rate in rent regulated housing of 5% or less, not less than 5%. People make that mistake all the time. It's 5% or less, that is the legal standard. Um, but the HVS measures the vacancy rate of all rental housing, uh, public housing, uh, subsidized housing, market rate housing, et cetera. And that's the uh, standard. I mean, there's a lot of questions about whether we should be thinking about getting away from this whole concept of a declaration of emergency defined on a, a basis of a, of a vacancy rate of 5% or less. No one ever did a scientific study to determine that at a vacancy rate of 4.5%, you've got a housing emergency, but at a vacancy rate of 5.5%, you don't. And if you stop and think about it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's just a number that's been pulled out of the air and inserted into state law. But be that as it may, the current law requires you to act uh, by March of this coming year, March of 2021. You can only do a one-year extender under the state law, but um, and, and then the following year, you will have the whole thing. Now, whether the market changes and whether people move back to the city or new people move to the city or whatever remains to be seen, uh, by the time this comes becomes an issue, but um, I don't think I don't think the city is going to become a ghost town. It did for a few months. That was very interesting, but I don't think that's uh, a yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a permanent state. Got it. Okay. Thank thank you for that. Thanks for the answer. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. We'll next hear from Thomas Edwards, followed by Rebecca Engel and Alexandra Doherty. Thomas. Part in time. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Thomas Edwards. I want to thank you for having me. Uh, I've actually served 21 years and two, two days in prison and was released about six years and eight months ago. So, of course, I want to talk about reentry and housing. Uh, when I left prison, I was given $40 in a bus ticket. I was fortunate to have family members that accepted me back in. However, I didn't have any credit history, let alone credit, so I definitely couldn't get a place on my own. And unfortunately, the same family members that allowed me back in at some point, I needed to leave in a few months. And the options I had was either a shelter or my daughter's couch. And, you know, it, it wasn't a many options. There was a number of different organizations that, you know, was, was trying to help with housing for people coming out of prison, but there was no structure, no foundation, no linkage from state prison to New York City for me. Although they was aware that I was returning to New York City for four or five months prior to my return after I made the parole board. But yet there was nothing in place for me to actually have and to be able to use. And, and you know, I not only did not have credit, I didn't have a credit history. So we talk about reentry, and I don't think we take into 
uh, consideration that a lot of us who are being released from prison, especially after decades, we was never part of society. We lived in a subculture, so it was not re-entry. I never had a credit card prior to, to leaving prison. I, I mean, I didn't even carry ID regularly. So when we talk about re-entry and when does it start pre-release, it should start the day you go into prison. It shouldn't wait for you know years and months. For instance, I went to prison for a violent crime. I didn't get anger management or aggression retention training until maybe 16, 17 years later. So was there really a problem or did they just need to do this for paperwork? And, you know, a lot of things that the council talked about today with housing, with NYCHA, being, you know, not allowed in because of crime. Sorry, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, listen, everyone's testimony is important. I don't want anyone to think that their testimony isn't valued because of the, the time limits. Um, but we do need to uh, close the hearing at about 4.30. And uh, we want to give everyone a chance to, to have their say. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Rebecca Engel, followed by Alexandra Doherty and Elizabeth Williams. Rebecca. Hi, good afternoon. My good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Engel. I'm Senior Policy Counsel at the Fortune Society, uh, which I think you've already heard about enough today. Um, we are involved with a lot of re-entry projects. Um, but Fortune is here today to talk about the problems that individuals re-entering society from jail or prison face in simply find, trying to find a place to live. So just the bare fact is that 20% of Fortune's clients are homeless. This is an enormous number and one that reflects what some people call the prison to shelter pipeline. And one of the reasons that these numbers are so high is because of the current rules of NYCHA, including what we call the permanent exclusion rule, which decides to place the label of non-desirability on person. This means so that a, a former tenant who committed a dangerous act as a teenager and whose prison sentence ended perhaps 20 years ago is still not able to come and visit his new granddaughter on NYCHA premises. That said, the new recommendations that, uh, that NYCHA has come out they seem like they have the potential for a shift in values at NYCHA, mainly through this proposed process of individualized review rather than automatic exclusion. Because under these uh, proposed new rules, NYCHA states that it will change its admission policy from one of blanket denials to one of individualized review, similar to what it currently does under its family reentry program. And uh, we, need to, we need to think about how the family reentry pro program actually doesn't actually require a lot of proof of rehabilitation. It's more about spotting a few red flags, i.e. if the applicant has an open order of protection filed by an individual who still resides in the development, that would be a problem. But NYCHA should actually, when it should confide a lot in its own family family reentry program in order to create this program. But NYCHA does need to take a few more critical steps in order to improve this process. First, NYCHA should put in writing a decision standard. Okay, is that it? That is, is it. That it? Um, All that right. It, but, All but, right. That's what written testimony please, is for. Please feel free. Yeah. To send us uh, your testimony in writing. Um, we do look at it, and um, just a reminder to everyone to to follow. Uh, we've got, you got two minutes. So like try to get to the meat as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. So next up we'll hear from Alexandra Doherty followed by Elizabeth Williams and Sarah Wolkendorfer. Alexandra. Starting time. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alexandra Doherty. I'm a senior staff attorney and policy counsel of the civil justice practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today in support of removing barriers to public housing for New Yorkers with arrest and conviction histories. Uh, NYCHA has an existing practice of denying applicants and evicting households based on any contact with the criminal justice system, not just based on the highest level convictions as suggested earlier. Uh, we know that stable housing is a critical foundation to successful reentry, yet NYCHA relies on the mere existence of an arrest or conviction to bar justice involved New Yorkers from housing. These policies contribute to the existing homelessness crisis, which will soon be compounded by the looming wave of evictions brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we commend the city council for its effort to address barriers to housing with intro uh, 2047, but like council member 11 mentioned, 
Uh, this will not apply to public housing where background checks are explicitly incorporated into NYCHA rules. NYCHA's regulations go much further than required by federal law in barring tenants based on arrest and conviction history. Um, NYCHA's strict eligibility criteria have the harshest impact on families and communities with minor law enforcement contact. We at BDS routinely see the effects of these policies on our clients who are denied eligibility based on a single arrest. NYCHA also routinely seeks to terminate the tenancy of entire households based on a single arrest or conviction of one family member. The pretext for pursuing termination is to maintain safety, but there's no evidence that this approach prevents future crime. NYCHA often rushes forward with termination proceedings before the criminal case can be resolved in the tenant's favor, meaning that tenants often agree to permanent exclusion or worse, their tenancies are terminated based on criminal cases that eventually get dismissed and sealed. Uh, now, BDS is submitting joint comments regarding NYCHA's proposed policy, but I'll highlight a couple important points. Uh, we support NYCHA's goal of the proposed committee review. To provide, well, I'll, I'll direct the committees to our written testimony, which we'll submit. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll hear Elizabeth Williams, followed by Sarah Wolkendorfer and Kingsley Rowe. Elizabeth? Starting Good afternoon. Time. My name is Elizabeth Williams, social worker, supervisor with the Protestant Defenders. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice has taken advantage of thousands of vacant hotel rooms uh, to provide safe temporary housing to people exiting city and state custody who would otherwise be forced to enter the shelter system. And this initiative has positively impacted our clients by addressing their immediate reentry needs and providing much needed stability supported defenders' release efforts through strengthening bail applications in court and aided the CDC incarceration efforts to reduce the jail population. These efforts highlight how investing in our most vulnerable New Yorkers strengthens communities. The city should embrace the lessons of this emergency response by investing in the expansion of temporary housing for all system-involved New Yorkers. We recommend first expanding the hotel program's resources to extend eligibility to people made homeless at criminal court arraignments by orders of protection. In most cases, a person who returns home in violation of an order of protection risks rearrest, prosecution, and pretrial detention. Expanding this criteria provides viable housing options to people pushed into a cycle of homelessness stemming from a court order. Second, we recommend creating a formal referral pathway for individuals leaving federal detention facilities to access the reentry hotel rooms. Offering stable housing plans for our clients in an immigration and proceedings strengthens bond applications and making this option available to this population means fewer New Yorkers will languish in ICE custody as they awake hearings. This current pandemic emphasizes how critical the need for basic necessities, such as food and housing, is upon release from detention. And anyone being released from custody of any kind should receive basic necessities to ensure what they have, uh, they need to stabilize and reduce the likelihood of future system contact. I'll also direct our attention to our written testimony as well. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. We'll now hear from Sarah Wolkendorfer, followed by Kingsley Rowe and Alex McDougall. Sarah. Hi, my name is Sarah Wolfenberfer, supervising attorney in the civil defense practice at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. I'd like to use my time to share two examples of how NYCHA's continued reliance on an adversarial and punitive approach to admissions and lease terminations based on an arrest or conviction stymie reentry efforts, separate families and ultimately harm the NYCHA community. One specific NDS client we represented in the past was Ms. Miller, a black mother with a 30 year addiction history facing termination to her, based on her arrest for possession of a controlled substance in her home. Ms. Miller was identified as a candidate for Manhattan Drug Court, a diversion program which would allow her to defer criminal sentencing provided she successfully complete extensive treatment. Rather than staying the termination proceedings against her to give her the opportunity to reap the benefits of this program, NYCHA's attorney insisted on moving the hearing forward. While NYCHA was able to assist, or NDS was able to assist Ms. Miller in successfully fighting these proceedings, countless other NYCHA residents are steamrolled by the termination process, even when they are actively engaged in programs meant to promote rehabilitation and reentry. Another NDS client, Mr. Grant, a single black father of a two-year-old boy also faced discrimination by NYCHA when he was denied housing because of his conviction history. As a teenager, he received an A misdemeanor conviction 
for petty larceny. Three years later, when he applied for NYCHA tenancy with his young son and was fast-tracked because the two were living in a shelter, he was denied under NYCHA's current policy, which prohibits the admission of individuals with an AIM misdemeanor for four years, no matter what, full stop, after an individual's conviction or release from incarceration, whichever is later. And because of that reason, Mr. Grant and his young son were denied. While NDS and Mr. Grant were able to overturn the denial, many other applicants without legal representation are not so lucky and may never be able to reside in a home of their own. By maintaining these housing barriers beyond those required by federal law and by vesting NYCHA attorneys with broad discretion to resolve termination cases, the proposed changes to admissions and exclusion policies will continue to frustrate rehabilitation and reentry efforts. Thank and you, Mrs. hawkins -Dorf. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Kingsley Rowe, followed by Alex McDougall and Kevin Van Hook. Um, hi. Um, can you give me every? Oh, uh, can you give me a minute? Uh, let me know when there's a minute, like one minute, two minute, three minutes. Sure. I want to make sure I get through to my my, my recommendation. So you have you have two minutes. I'll give you a one minute warning, and I'll give you a twenty second warning. It sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. Um, my name is Kingsley Rowe. I'm a forensic social worker with the New York County Defender Services. My name, well, I'm a forensic social worker with the New York County Defender Services. NYC is a, de a public defender office that represents people in thousands of cases in Manhattan criminal courts every year. I've been helping people to reenter these communities after incarceration since 2006. I'm in, I'm in my current role as New York County Defender Services social worker. I support our clients leaving Rikers and other city jails. The latest challenge facing our clients is housing and I'm pleased to testify about the steps uh, that city council should take in supporting the returning citizens. Um, in addition to the nearly 15 years in social work experience I have, I'm also a person directly affected by the criminal justice system. I strongly believe that the access of safe housing was critical in my subsequent success and ability to gain a social work degree and pursue my own career and start a family. Unlike many other clients, when I'm released from prison, One minute. I had a safe place to go. My father owns a home and he invited me to come live with him until I was able to get on my own feet into the job market and, and school. Fortunately, unlike most uh, New Yorkers, they don't have an opportunity to do so. Um, I'm going to move on to the lack of affordable housing. The number of one, the one, the number one barrier to successful reentry is New York City affordable housing. If anyone knows Maslow, Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, in order for someone to reach the actualization, they have to have the basic minimum uh, uh, um, uh, things in order to, to progress. Um, you know, the problem that is most difficult for me is supporting them with. Uh, All, 20 seconds, sir. Oh, oh, sorry. I'll send my written statements, but I would like to say this. Work with public offenders and NYPD and mayor office and district attorney offices and community groups to no, decrease sorry. to decrease or uh, arrest, eliminate partial detention in most circumstances to support alternative to incarceration and to eliminate significant reduce reentry housing reentry housing needs by sending people to jail less. Fully fund supportive housing ACI, ACT, ACT programs and reentry programs like the castle, which is amazing to ensure that people returning to jail and prison have a safe place to live. Pass all seven housing related bills that are on the agenda before the committees on general welfare and civil and human rights in September, 2020. These bills include intros 202146. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Rowe. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. We will now hear from Alex McDougall, followed by Kevin Van Hook and Reverend Calderon Payne. Alex. Starting time. Alex McDougall. We will we can continue with um, Kevin Van Hook. 
followed by Reverend Calderon Payne. Kevin? Start in time. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Reverend Kevin Van Hook, and I serve as the Minister of Social Justice at the Riverside Church. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify on this critical hearing uh, uh, to address our city's reentry system. On behalf of the 1,200 families that make up the Riverside Church, we're proud to be a part of a coalition of faith leaders, activists, and advocates called Faith Communities for Just Reentry. Many years ago, uh, William Sloan Coffin would often mount the pulpit at Riverside and say that the world is too small for anything but truth and too dangerous for anything but love. And so with that being said, we know that we live in a time in history where we desperately need truth tellers. And so uh, there are some, some very hard truths about our current re-entry system that we cannot afford to go um, unaddressed. And so the truth is that each year, nearly 20,000 New Yorkers are caught in this cycle of homelessness and incarceration due to the holes in our current re-entry system. The truth is that during the COVID pandemic, people are have been released without ident proper identification, critical medication, or coronavirus testing. The truth is that involvement in the city's criminal justice the system should not put someone on the path to homelessness or poverty in the middle of a pandemic. And so therefore, today we're calling on our city's leadership to provide safety for justice involved individuals during the COVID pandemic by providing identification cards for individuals upon release, effectively transitioning people's health care from Rikers to their community, and ensuring everyone has access to COVID testing during the discharge process. We're also calling on our city's leadership to um, unlock the housing supply for justice involved individuals and their families by eliminating the NYCHA permanent exclusion policy and combating landlord discrimination by increasing both the supply and value of housing vouchers. And we're also calling on you to develop a coordinated re-entry system accountable to the well-being of each person. And as we say in our tradition, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. And so I thank you for the work you're already doing, but we are, are willing to stand beside you all and continue to, to fight until we I build understand. a future for all uh, all New Yorkers. And so thank you for your time. Thank you. We're gonna circle back to Alex McDougall um, and give you another chance to testify. Starting time. It seems we could be having some audio issues with um, Alex McDougall. So you are welcome to submit your testimony at testimony at council.nyc. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. No? Starting time. Yeah, OK. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> So my name is Alex McDougall and I'm a staff attorney in the Civil Law Reform Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Um, and today I'd like to focus on NYCHA's remaining family members, which are a group that we view as being consistently overlooked and routinely denied genuine consideration when it comes to criminal background. Um, so when a tenant of record in a NYCHA unit dies or moves away, remaining household members frequently seek to continue living in their home and have often been living in their homes for years or decades. Um, but despite long ties that remaining family members have to their homes and communities, NYCHA really does not provide remaining family members with adequate protections and it results in unjust and unnecessary evictions and uh, you know, exacerbates our homelessness crisis. So NYCHA has a three-step process, which is at the, an interview at the development level, an appeal at the borough level, and then third, uh, a hearing. And NYCHA has discretion to offer a grievance a lease at any point during that process. Um, the review, the development review involves a criminal background check and pursuant to its admission standards and under federal law, NYCHA is required to give applicants the opportunity to provide additional information for context, background, to explain facts, rebut adverse information prior to a finding of ineligibility. Um, but in practice, remaining family members are denied just automatically based on their conviction record. Uh, we have de developed both development and uh, borough staff have repeatedly asserted to us that the only way to overcome a finding of ineligibility is based on a conviction record is to go to a hearing, even though NYCHA's own rules dictate a three-step consideration. Um, and according to NYCHA's own hearings data, uh, only one finding of ineligibility based on a conviction history was reversed following a McNair hearing um, in 2015 and zero were, 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 were reversed in 2016 and 2017. Um, so I guess I will submit my written testimony so you can learn more. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Reverend Calderon Payne, followed by Minister Phillips and Beatriz de la Torre. Reverend? Hi, I am Reverend. Le 
I am Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne. I'm the Executive Director of Bronx Connect, Manhattan Connect, and Release the Grip. I'm also a member of the Faith Communities for Just Reentry and a New York City ATI Coalition member. Since 1999, we have successfully supported Justin's involved youth and families um, as they navigate their way out of destructive lifestyles and into fulfilling productive lives. Our community-based model works. In 2018, Dr. Trevor Milton researched 161 graduates of our program and found that a whopping 97% of them went three years without a felony conviction. This is quite an incredible fact, given that 95% of these youth were referred to our program for facing violent felonies. Our community-driven successful model demonstrates once again that those closest to the problem know the solutions to the problems they face, yet they are farthest from the resources to solve them. Here are two common sense changes New York City can enact right now, today, to give those coming out of incarceration a better chance of succeeding. One, so simple, give everyone leaving Rikers an ID card. Without an ID card, it's nearly impossible to access any kind of support for employment, housing, or any benefit. It's such a simple solution, we have to ask why it has not been mandated already. But two, make homelessness prevention um, vouchers that the city issues usable. The city FEPS vouchers currently fall short of their fair rental market value. Um, they're obnoxiously short. All city council members should support 146 to bring the voucher values back up closer to section eight values. A hope deferred makes a heart sick and it's unrighteous of the city to give out these vouchers that cannot be utilized. I would also encourage city council to inquire as to where the monetary value of the 11,000 unused vouchers went last year. They represent over $200 million in one year. In closing, inspired. city is truly a progressive city. We must create policies that seek to support all people. These simple changes can make a wealth of difference and keep our neighbors at home and away from the cycle of incarceration. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Minister Phillips, followed by Beatrice de Torre and Lucas Pershing. Can you hear me? Starting time. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Peace and blessings, everyone. I'm Minister Dr. Victoria Phyllis Miss V, and I'm a member of the um, Fair Chance for Housing Coalition and Jails Action Coalition, and I also work at the Mental Health Project Urban Justice Center. And I say all that because over the last 20 years, I've worked in criminal justice, mental health, and nursing. I've did cognitive behavioral um, therapy in prisons and jails, and I've worked for the large part in reentry for 15, 18 years, right? And so we know for a fact that over 50% of New York City um, people incarcerated in facilities have some form of mental health concern. So that means that they are part of our vulnerable populations, that we are supposed to make sure have a safe and secure place to call home, along with everyone else. But let's just talk about the vulnerable population. We cannot forget that fact. Also, I want to point out that residents of NYCHA are heavily policed by PSA officers. So when someone says they're not supposed to have any more contact or an additional contact, it's very hard as a Black person because statistics say that one out of three Black males have some form of um, of criminal justice record or, or contact. So it's very unrealistic for NYCHA to think that no one coming back will then again have contact with a NYPD officer or the criminal justice system. I also want to point out this council um, that's supposed to be deciding if someone is rehabilitated enough, where are they trained? Who are these people? Do they have biases that they bring in with them while they make these decisions? We have to be clear and hold them accountable on that. I also want to point out, point out that people in NYCHA have to be connected directly to a, a, um, a blood relative. Many people grew up in foster care. For my teenage years, I was in foster care. I knew my parents, but I didn't have access to them. So someone who falls in those lines, what does that look like in our society, in our city, when we say that they are not worthy of a home because they don't have a blood relative? What are we talking about as human beings and as as Americans. And I've seen people be charged with grand larceny over an iPhone. So does that mean that someone that's charged with grand, grand larceny over an iPhone is not worthy of, of, of having housing anymore? I got, I got you. So um, I just want to say one more thing. In our community, we have to make sure that we look out for each other. It's not about privilege. Even this meeting right here, you're rushing all the public comments through for in that 430. Meanwhile, this is impacting our direct lives. And it's your duties as council members to make sure that you hear from the people, your constituents. So do better and do your jobs. Y'all have a blessed day. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Beatrice de la Torre 
followed by Lucas Pershing and Zachary Katz Nelson. Good afternoon. Starting time. Good afternoon. My name is Bea de la Torre, and I'm the Managing Director for Housing and Homelessness at Trinity Church Wall Street. Trinity Church is committed to breaking the cycle of mass incarceration and mass homelessness that impacts nearly 20,000 New Yorkers each year. We are conveners of the Faith Communities for Just Reentry, an interfaith coalition of more than 40 faith leaders across the five boroughs. Together, we are calling upon Mayor de Blasio and the City Council to create a just reentry system. This means providing for the safety of New Yorkers released from the city's jails during the COVID-19 crisis, stable housing for justice-involved individuals and their families, and a coordinated support service reentry system that is accountable to the well-being of each person. Without reform, the city forces these families and individuals into homelessness. We strongly support two pieces of legislation before the council. We support intro 146 to raise the value of city FAPS vouchers to fair market value so the households can actually use them to avoid homelessness. We also support intro 2047, the Fair, Ch fair Chance for Housing Act, which would prohibit private landlords from discriminating against New Yorkers with criminal records. We thank Council Member Levin for introducing these bills and commend the New York City Commission on Human Rights for committing to vigorously enforce these protections. Ending discrimination in the private market is not enough, however. The largest landlord in the city is our own public housing authority. If just one member of a household is arrested, not even convicted, just arrested, NYCHA can begin termination of tenancy proceedings against an entire family. NYCHA should also expand its family reunification program. We ask that every member of this body submit comments to NYCHA before October 28th to demand access for all New Yorkers. In addition, the City Council should pass legislation to require the Department of Corrections and the Human Resources Administration to issue IDs to every New Yorker discharged from jails. An ID card means access to medications, to jobs, and of course, to housing. In closing, the Faith Communities for Just Reentry redoubles its call for Mayor de Blasio, Speaker Johnson, and the entire City Council to develop a coordinated reentry system. It is the just and moral thing to do. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Lucas Pershing, followed by Zachary Katz Nelson and Allison, and Allison Wilkie. Lucas? Starting time. Hello, all. I will refer you to the comments made by uh, the faith leaders that are on this call. We are all from Faith Leaders for Just Reentry, our faith communities for just reentry. So, Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne, Amy Glickman from Central Synagogue, Beatriz De La Torre from Trinity Church Wall Street, Reverend Kevin Van Hook from Riverside Church. Um, have said it all, so thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Zachary Katz Nelson, followed by Allison Wilkie. Starting time. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Zachary Katz Nelson. I'm the policy director at the Littman Commission, and thanks for the chance to testify. I just want to thank as well all the city staff, our agency staff that are still on. Uh, typically, a lot of folks leave after they testify. And, Grateful that those of you who have stayed are still here to listen to public testimony. Um, I just want to focus on supportive housing. I mean, we all know how critically important this is. You know, really disappointing news to hear that none of the JISH beds that have been funded uh, are online or coming online anytime soon. You know, almost a year after the RFP was issued, uh, and there, you know, was seems to have very little urgency by the city to make sure these beds come online. Grateful to the chair Lansman for really pushing on that. Because, you know, these beds are so necessary, particularly for people with mental illness. You know, I was speaking recently with a doctor who for years has provided mental health care at Rikers. And the number one thing he says that people need when they come out of Rikers is not continuity of care, which, of course, is critically important. But the number one thing is housing. Because if you don't have housing, you're not going to be stable in terms of your mental health treatment. The chance of reentry successfully drops dramatically. The chance of returning to Rikers rockets up. Uh, and so just really... We ask that the council keep on the city to keep pushing, not just to bring the dish beds that are already funded online, but to expand the, the number of beds that we have. And we just look at the cost alone, roughly $30,000 per bed per year for supportive housing, $500,000 per person per year at Rikers. So it, it's not only people won't be subjected to the inhumane violence and brutality at Rikers, be so much better off, but the city will save tremendous money if we can get these beds online and work properly. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Allison Wilkie, followed by Jordan Rosenthal and Avi Gross. Allison? Hi, my name Starting is Allison Wilkie. 
My name is Allison Wilkie, and I'm the Director of Public Policy at the John Jay College uh, Institute for Justice and Opportunity. I want to use my time to address some of the testimony we had by government agencies. Chair Amprey Samuel, you asked NYCHA in several ways how many people are terminated based on involvement with the criminal legal system, and you didn't get a complete answer. So in 2017, there were 98 families who were terminated because of involvement with the criminal legal system, in addition to the 464 families who were permanently excluded, or individuals who were permanently excluded. In 2018, that's 100 families who had their leases terminated, in addition to the 313 who were permanently excluded. And in 2019, there are 96 uh, families terminated, in addition to 316 individuals um, who were permanently excluded. So these are significant numbers of people who are losing their home based on arrest charges. So you asked what types of crimes um, people were excluded for, and NYCHA gave a laundry list of serious sounding crimes. Let's be clear that they NYCHA proceeds forward based on arrest charges chosen by NYPD, not by what happens in the criminal legal system. So if other, as other people have said, you can lose your home even though you are never convicted in criminal court, and that is part of NYCHA's current policy. And while I appreciate that NYCHA is taking some steps to review their policies, their steps do not go far enough. And uh, again, Chair Amprey Samuel, you asked the question, what evidence is there that in exclusion increases safety? There is no evidence, it's counterproductive. Why would we think that excluding someone who's been arrested, kicking them out from their home, separating from, the, from, from their family and putting them into survival mode would keep them from getting in trouble again or, keep, or, or increase public safety? This policy has been in existence for decades and there's no correlation between crime rates and NYCHA and enforcement of this policy. This policy needs to end. Um, and I have full comments in, that I'll submit for re uh, our written recommendations based on NYCHA's policy, but I also want to address HPD's comments about their policy. I believe that HPD said that their January marketing handbook has time limitations for review of criminal record. That is not true. If you look at their January 2020 marketing handbook, it had, uh, simply limits housing providers to the guidelines provided by HUD. There's no time limitation. HPD uses criminal record. And I just want to say that we also have a solution to many of these problems in the private market with intro 2047. Uh, we really have to double down on addressing racism in the criminal legal system that then gets used in our housing system to deny people housing. People should not have to prove that they are worthy of having a home and we have to end the system of perpetual Thank punishment. You. Thank you, Ms. Wilkie. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jordan Rosenthal, followed by, followed by Avi Gross and Lyric Thompson. Jordan. Thank you. And Starting time. Thank you for the committee chairs and the staff that are still on the line. I just want to echo what um, Zachary Katz Nelson was saying. It's really refreshing to see you sticking through this. Um, my name is Jordan Rosenthal, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the Women's Community Justice Association, which is the sister organization to Housing Plus, which runs the Women's Community Justice Project, the only gender-specific ATI in New York City. We are also members of the Fair Chance for Housing Coalition, and we want to say right off the bat that we do support 2047 and that should be um, passed as soon as possible. But what I'm here to talk about today more specifically is the fact that formerly incarcerated women are more likely than their male peers to be homeless. They're actually, when you get more specific, they're more likely to be sheltered homeless, but that does not make a difference in the sense of like, the fact that people need stable housing. And specifically, the JISH beds need to be expanded. It's really good to see that there will be beds coming online, and we are looking forward to that RFP that is coming out. But we really need to expand their use and almost family use. There are less than 200 women currently on Rikers Island right now. We can get that down below 100 easily. 153 of those women are pre-trial. They, When we take women and keep them locked in Rikers Island. They are disrupting their family connections. They're more likely to lose their stable housing, which puts them back into a worse spot than being, you know, before they are actually um, arrested or put into Rikers. Um, by having these just beds, we can actually really work on decarceration and go specifically through case by case, each woman and come 
forward with a recommendation on how to get women out of Rikers, but it's only possible if they're stable housing. Think about ourselves and the challenges that we face as individuals. Would we be able, where would we work if we had a job, but we, you know, we're in the shelter and we were like working remotely? How would you do that? Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Avi Gross, followed by Lyric Thompson and Devon Nash. Start in time. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, the Council on February 2nd, 2016, held a meeting in City Council, and the topic was uh, rent stabilized apartments that should be registered because developers got tax breaks, except they weren't being registered. ProPublic approved that essentially the public was being ripped off and developers were taking $100 million every year in tax breaks without providing the affordable housing. This was admitted by HPD in the testimony that was given four years ago. What has happened in, in four years? Absolutely nothing. Council Member Cohn, if you are still on this call, please reach out, ask me a question after, because you, you said exactly what the problem is. There is enough affordable housing, vacant affordable housing, to house each of the 60,000 homeless people in New York City today. All it takes is for council members to feel accountability to the public. The application process of affordable housing is an absolute disgrace. If you just want to look at what I've been through, so after 10 years, you can see all these documents, like 350 documents that I gave. I was supposed to sign a lease, and then this came. You're rejected for inconsistent information. That was the only explanation I got. Except inconsistent information is not one of the legitimate reasons for rejection on the regulatory agreement. Next, they claimed that my income was too low, except that if you look at these numbers, none of them match the 350 documents I sent. Then they claimed that my income in 2017 and 18 was too low, except that the regulatory agreement says that they have to go by um, income in 2019. I ended up in a homeless shelter where they completely um, forego the max income limit. That, that made fine. no difference to them. I'll just complete this point, please, if I could have 15 seconds. This was an email where it came out that HPD is asking Breaking Ground if they even bother to look at the application submitted. Essentially, here is my point. Affordable housing, it gets thrown away. This honorable chair, you can solve all problems in New York because the problem is the apartments are not going to the public. They, they are being embezzled by people. I, I have. Thank you, Mr. Gross. Council Member Cohen. Yep. Next, we will hear from Lyric Thompson, followed by Devon Nash and Amy Glickman. Lyric. Hi, my name is Lyric Sorry. Thompson. Hello, my name is Lyric Thompson and A.B. Gross. Thank you so much for bringing up that ProPublica article that came out in 2016. That was about my building. Now, when, when I first signed up to, to speak, it was about 1760, and I have serious concerns about HPD's ability to enforce anything. We've had over 300 inspections on our building and HPD never noticed that the front door to my building wasn't fire rated. It took the building getting sealed shut and me contacting Tim Hogan of DOB to get a violation. HPD comes out, writes violations, removes it a little while later and that defective equipment had to be removed by the fire department. We need to upgrade the standards of HPD's inspections and enforcement. Now, with regard to the criminal activity that HPD allows, I'm sitting here listening to all these people lose their homes in NYCHA. What did HPD do to the developer, Alan Packnush, when he submitted a notarized statement from a lady that had been dead for three years at the time of notary? They asked him to remove it and submit something else. That is how serious HPD took my complaint. What did HPD do about the fact that the architectural papers were forged? Not a goddamn thing, but send me to 311. I have to beg Amory Santiago for screens without holes in it because the woman doesn't know the meaning of an impertinence. I am not for nothing. Sorry, guys. I, I am really just a bit triggered 
by sitting here listening to all of my fellow citizens getting screwed by housing preservation development in NYCHA. Why the double standard? Why are we allowing developers to get away with criminal activity and then turning around and acting like we give a shit about affordable housing? If you want developers to stop ripping people off, try holding them accountable for the laws that they violate. And can someone please explain to me where HPD gets the statutory authority to tell a developer to rip heating out of the common areas of a rent stabilized building? Time expired. Thank you. We will now hear from Devon Nash, followed by Amy Glickman and Corey Bronson. Hey, good, good afternoon. afternoon. My name is Devon Nash here. And I'm a little sad today because my nephew and I, we're in a shelter system right now. And um, everything that everyone was saying sounds very good. But up until today, what was happening with yesterday? All of these things that you know how important it is for housing, how important it is for family connects, for families to stay together, and all of these things that were put into place to, to, to undo all those things. And then you said, okay, okay, we made a mistake then. Today we're gonna to fix it. But I happen to be the one that come in in 2015 um, out of federal prison <clears throat> with no place to go. A uh, family member uh, got me a place to stay with someone and that the landlord decided because they found out that I had a criminal history in 2017, um, <clears throat> uh, started the process of evicting me. Um, I had no help. I was going back and forth to court. I was in college at the time. So the judge was a little sympathetic. And he, the only thing he did was <clears throat> he waited until, he said I had to leave by August of 20, uh, seven, by August of that year. The landlord um, turned the lights out. So I could not stay in there. So I, I, I had to move, I, I left. <clears throat> My nephew was 18 years old at the time. Uh, we entered this, uh, we, I put in, I, I might have spent $500 on criminal background checks for apartments um, that I, was, I wasn't qualified for. Um, I, I needed all of this stuff. So I was forced into the shelter system in January because I, I just had nowhere else to go with my nephew. And I was forced into the shelter system of January, 2018. And from that day, they have been paying $120 a day for my nephew and I to stay in the shelter. Uh, they give over, it's over $6,000, uh, $293 per month. Um, I've been here over 33 oh, months. That amount of money could have been spent to buy me an apartment, a two bedroom apartment. I could have bought a two bedroom apartment. Um, I, I just- Thank, thank I, what, you, Mr. Nash. <clears throat> thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Amy Glickman, followed by Corey Bronson. Amy. Starting time. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Glickman, and I'm a board trustee of Central Synagogue. Central is a proud Reformed Jewish congregation, one of the largest in the United States, and a member of the Union for Reform Judaism. We are an inclusive community of over 2,600 families, most of us in and around New York City. I'm here today because Central is proud to be part of an interfaith coalition, Faith Communities for Just Reentry, with the National Action Network, Riverside Church, Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of New York, Trinity Church Wall Street, and many others. Faith Communities for Just Reentry calls on the New York City Council and Mayor Bill de Blasio to step up to ensure that returning New Yorkers have at least the basic tools they need to rejoin society. What are these tools? As we've heard from others who've testified, give everyone leaving Rikers an ID NYC card. In New York City in 2020, nobody can pick up medication, apply for employment, housing, education, or health insurance without an ID. If people leaving state prison can get an ID NYC, people leaving city jail should do so too. Make city homelessness prevention vouchers usable. New York City Council Bill Intro 146 would raise rental assistance vouchers to market rates. This is a more effective and less expensive use of public funds than congregate shelters and hotels. And finally, as we've heard, NYCHA should stop separating families by eliminating their policy to automatically exclude people from NYCHA housing after arrests and releases. We at Central Synagogue and the Faith Community for Just Reentry Coalition 
urged the New York City Council to clear a path for New Yorkers to return home from city jails, to rejoin their families and seek employment and health care. This helps them and it helps all of us. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Last but not least, we will now hear from Corey Bronson. Starting time. My name is Corey Brinson. I'm testifying in favor of Bill 2047. This bill would eliminate the practice of landlords discriminating, discriminating against people with conviction histories for seeking, seeking rental housing. housing. I serve as a policy associate at the Legal Action Center. The Legal Action Center uses legal and policy strategies to fight discrimination, build health equity, and restore opportunities for people with arrests and conviction records, substance use disorders, and HIV. Uh, the city council should pass this important next step generation civil rights bill because people with criminal convictions already face difficult challenges, especially those returning from prisons and jails to reintegrate into society. These challenges include, but not limited, attaining employment, family connections, community integration, but they also include securing safe and affordable housing. While there are protections for people with criminal histories who are seeking employment, there are no legal protections for people with criminal histories who are seeking housing under local, state, and federal law. In fact, the law currently discourages the renting of apartments to people with criminal convictions in public housing. People cannot find stable housing or are less likely to establish positive family relationships, find employment, and successfully integrate into the community. According to the Coalition for the Homeless in 2018, 20% of adults who entered New York City shelters did so directly from a jail or prison. And for the same reasons, New York passed the Fair Chance Act in 2015 so that people with criminal convictions would have a fair chance at employment. We must now act and provide the same meaningful opportunity so that people with criminal convictions can secure housing. It is no coincidence that in 2017, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice found that 40% of people serving a short jail sentence were homeless. The law in this area needs reform. The bill, this bill is reasonable because it takes into the landlord's business interests. Um, it does not restrict the landlord uh, from, I'm sorry? It, it does not restrict the landlord Thank you. This concludes the public testimony. If we've inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, if that person could raise their hand using the Zoom raise hand function, we will try to hear from you now. All right, seeing none, I'll turn it back over to Chair Lansman to close the hearing. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Um, in particular, I want to thank the uh, co-chairs of this hearing. That would be uh, Chair uh, Alika uh, Amprey Samuel, um, uh, Council Member Levin, Council Member Cornegy. Um, who else we got? That's still here. Well, um, and also uh, all of the staff of our respective committees, um, all of whom worked very hard uh, to prepare us for, uh, for this hearing. Um, I wanna thank uh, Mock J, HPD, um, and all the other uh, Department of Corrections, uh, all the other agencies who sent people to testify uh, at this hearing, and also to thank the members of the public. I know it can be frustrating uh, to only get a certain amount of time to be able to speak. Uh, but the uh, focus of our hearing today was to try to get answers from the administration. And I think we made a lot of progress uh, doing that. Do any of my uh, fellow chairs have anything that they want to say to, to close things out? Seeing none, I want to thank uh, everyone for their participation. And that 